cry. Yeah. Send those now. That thing ain't right. And my mind was gone and I was high. Cut, but I ain't cut. Stop acting like the dog. I'm God body now and I hit the gas, homie. The unclean fool, the thing is trash, homie. And every time you call, it's all bad, brody. But yep, I keep the high holy. Cop for the Lord like my name, Matthew Foley. You a five dollar homie. I'm acting like you know me. I done changed my way, nobody knows it. I'm Used to be the type of dude you didn't want to cross nope. Used to be a boss, yep. now I'm a king nah, Used to run the streets, now I'm a soldier for Christ uh -huh. Now I'm in the street trying to give my people life yep. Used to be the type of dude, the only one night yep. Never want a wife, nope. used to live tight uh -huh. How to switch it up, now I live righteous Now I live righteous Used to be the type of dude you didn't want to cross nope. Used to be a boss, yep. now I'm a king nah, Used to run the streets, now I'm a soldier for Christ. Uh -huh. Now I'm in the street trying to give my people life. Word. Used to be the type of dude, the only one night yep. Never want a wife, no. Nope. Used to live trifling. Yeah. I just switch it up. Now I live righteous. Now I live righteous. Hey, uh hey. -huh. All this hidden knowledge come first, I pass back. Hey, hey. They secret plot in one verse, I crash that. Hey, all this hidden knowledge come first, I pass back. Hey, you know that Babylon is go burst like Baghdad. Grow it day and night until it's no curse or backtrack. Try to tell her. Valley of death, I fear no evil. Don't care what they say, man, I don't hear no evil. Look at how that bomb drop won't be no sequel. Put all faith in my God, I see no equal. Hey, hey, where you been at? I've been on the block teaching my people where they drill at. All that hate you got for your brother, you better kill that. All that hate my people embracing, I do not feel that. Open, open up the app, follow along. Humbling down when I'm wrong. In Babylon, we don't belong. The hell they be on, going above and beyond. Reciting the word in the psalm, no breaking this bond. They don't know how to respond. Nah, 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 go back. Domino, king is back. Me on go, that's a fact. We the chose, who is that? Bring the foe, move attack, watch them cross. How they act, how to go, where we at? Coast to coast, where they at? Down below, ay. Lord, get the spirit, now it's on. Running through the valley, we won't be here for too long. They plotting on my people, we can see what they be on. And all I gotta say is one hour, one bomb, one hey. bomb, ay. They secret plotting, one verse, I crash that. Hey, all this hidden knowledge, come first, I pass back. Ay. You know that Babylon is gonna burst like Baghdad. Grow it day and night until it's no curse or backtrack. Try to tell her. Valley of death, I fear no evil. Don't care what they say, man, I don't hear no evil. Look at how that bomb drop won't be no sequel. Put all faith in my God, I see no equal. Been with it, can't stand with it. I'm kill switching like crazy. I must heal in it, my zeal in it. Can't let vision get jaded. All my kin with it, we built different. They might think of us crazy. And we still visit with kids, killing our kids. Look what they made it. Hey, now we out of camp and we could surely die. Fleeing sin, I'm terrified of being stranded in that fire. My people been all Hellenized and feeling bears will fix their life. This overthrow is televised. They see us standing up in Christ. We want ours back, but they want compact. This our exodus. Take your funds back. Come up against it. Guarantee that they won't come back. Hey, now just wait until my God back. Lord, get the spirit, now it's on. Running through the valley, we won't be here for too long. They plotting on my people, we can see what they be on. And all I gotta say is one hour, one bomb, one hey, bomb, hey. They secret plotting, one verse, I crash that. Hey, all this hidden knowledge, come first, I pass back. Hey, know that Babylon is gonna burst like Baghdad. Grow it day and night until it's no curse or backtrack. Try to tell her. Valley of death, I fear no evil. Don't care what they say, man, I don't hear no evil. Look at how that bomb drop won't be no sequel. Put all faith in my God, I see no evil. Dragon, dragon getting sick, we done made many foes. I, I, I seen many boats, but I seen plenty more foes. He, he, he was talking heat, Satan came, then he froze. But these are last days we came to save many souls. I got my reader on left, telling my people repent, the kingdom is next. Long as I'm reading, I'm blessed. My mind is all on the precept, don't need it to flesh. Pay me the evil is death, watch it wherever I step. No time left, I can't second guess, gotta duck that second death. They don't know how much you really took. We on the block, putting this straight from the book. N Nation time, I know these scars are shook. We bringing it out no matter how they look.
Ever since I've been in this truth, I move different, I think different, I see clear, done hooked up with a brother ring getting built up with no fear. I'm in the streets on a Sabbath day, crying loud, pouring out the scene, and a purple garment with gold friends, can let what they kill my savior in. Man, who'd have ever thought that the Lord told me to be a prophet? Man, we prophesying to follow Babylon with nuke rockets and against the pastor that twist the word, said teach for profit. Man, he the soul aside, he a straight coon and a blind watchman. And my folks trip. And they don't understand what my calling is And I understand cause I've been a fool for a lot of years Now I'm walking straight, gotta keep the faith till I reach the gate Getting persecuted for Christ's sake We teach the love but they call it hate I keep the law, teach the law, congregate so I won't fall And if I fall I got an advocate that'll go to the Father and debate the cause I was lost and walking dead, now I see the light like Paul D Fall in the step what Paul D, cause he fall out the Christ that's our head I keep the work up on my mind, I call it mind brain I keep it hanging in my face, that's my mind frame. I got the grit to push me through and ignore the hurt. Here's the reason I got dirt all up on my shirt. I put in work. Men of Israel, blow trumpets. Trumpets down. Heavenly Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, hallowed be thy name, Lord. Lord, we ask you to please allow us to continue to walk in faith and righteousness, Lord. We ask that you continue to give us your tender mercy and loving kindness, Lord, and be And be merciful upon us, Lord, as we continue to walk through and to make sure that we get our sins up off us, Lord. Lord, we ask that you please forgive us for the sins that we've committed upon you and that you be not hasty to destroy us, Lord. But in fact, Lord, we ask that you continue to be merciless with us. Thank you, Father, for all the blessings that you bestowed upon us. Thank you, Father for allowing us to come back to the law, statutes, and commandments and be acceptable unto you as we are tried as gold in the fire, Lord. We ask that you please bring destruction upon our enemies, Lord, that they be no more as they try to cut us off from being a people. We ask that you please give a uh, blessing unto the sick, Lord, that they may be restored back to health. We ask that you also Keep our leadership in prayer, Lord. The bishops, deacons, captains, soldiers, and brothers, officers, Lord. The sisters and the young children, Lord. We ask that you pray. Uh, we also pray for the food and the strong drink. And in, and in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Men of Israel, sons of God, patient saints. Sons of God, hand salute. Salute down. Face sisters. To the honorable daughters of Sarah, we say shalom. Shalom, shalom, most high Christ bless. Brothers and sisters, we have to make sure that we are praying often. When you stumble in your prayers, it's because you don't have a habit of praying. I can tell if, you, if you're praying even once a day, because the prayers should just flow through you, right? So when you find yourself struggling, Whatever excuse may come up about nerves and stuff like that, because it was in front of the camera, none of that should matter because your mind's not focused on that. Your mind's focused on the prayers. And it just flows off the tongue when you're praying often. All right? So it's evident when you get an opportunity to pray. See, I like to rotate brothers and throw them up and see how they do their prayers. 
because you could tell who prays on their own and who doesn't, all right? That's our way to commune with the Most High in a formal manner, so we got to make sure that we're doing that, all right? That's all I'll say about that. Okay. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. All praises for another one. We should be filled with joy with that, with happy Sabbath. Right. It should be, it's, it's, I'm ex I get excited for every Sabbath. I'm excited for every Sabbath. Not just High Holy Days, because the first High Holy Day is the weekly Sabbath. So everybody gets excited for Passover, Tabernacles. You know, Tabernacles is my favorite one. has become my favorite one. But the weekly Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath is where it's at. The weekly Sabbath is where it's at. Um, that's part of, we'll talk about some of that in a little bit when we deal with the topic today. Now, some of you in Phoenix got some of this uh, when I did a couple classes here last month. Um, the topic is the deceived that casually believe. And I will tell you this, it's not all encompassing. I had to stop myself uh, in putting this together because I felt that uh, I wouldn't be able to get through it. As it is, I'm, I got, I'm kind of doing a Bishop Yahweh stuff. Look, I got type pages. All right, I got type pages. <laughs> no, but he have them all stapled, and then he, <laughs> shout out to Bishop Yahweh And I got some notes. So we'll see how it flows, where the Lord want to take it, and what, and what actually comes out. Uh, I don't have any videos this time around to break it up, uh, but we'll, We'll see how it goes. But focus on the scripture aspect, and, and we'll see where it goes from there. And if you got something you want to add and jump in with your non-garment wearing self, you can. I don't know. I'm trying not to let all these little things derail me, all right? And then we woke up today, and our, our channel's got some strikes, so uh, some of you might not be aware, and you're tuning in on a new channel we had to create. The dragon is definitely wroth, and we're going to get to a point where these forums are not going to be there anymore for us to teach this way. Uh, Bishop recently mentioned, I think, maybe last week, and he said, but just, that's okay, because that's when we're going to go out by twos and multiply our efforts. You know, right now you got five, eight, nine, ten men in a camp, right? But now that's ten-man camp. That's five camps if you're doing two-man camp, all right? So we, 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 we ready to continue to do the Lord's mission. Um, so I want to talk about this casuality. Is that a word? I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> casuality. Um, we live in a world where, where casual is such a norm, right? It's become something of a norm, and it goes in everything, like being casual, right? Used to be you went to the office or a job interview, you know, I mean, I remember when I went to go interview at McDonald's, I, I, when I was in high school, I wore a shirt and tie. But now it's like you go to an interview for something that's more, uh, what's the word that they use? Not esteem, more prestigious. A more prestigious job. And some of y'all won't even wear like a tie and stuff like that. And then some people's extra. I'm sorry, I don't want to digress. Man, I remember I used to work for Eddie Bauer. Do you remember Eddie Bauer? I don't know if they're still around. Maybe just in catalog, but they had stores in Manhattan, right? And I think in some malls throughout the country. I used to work at Eddie Bauer. Man, this one brother came in in a tuxedo for his interview with Wallabies. <laughs> he had the tux and Wallabies. I said, oh, my goodness. But, you know, he took it to the extreme. I said, well, at least that. You know what I'm saying? Like, but casuals become so normal. People don't even know how to present appropriately. And look, I know you're going to have some people that talk about, oh, well, you know, you, you know, a suit is Esau thing or whatever. Listen, use wisdom in this world. Right? I remember we had one brother here who used to go to his job all the time in his traditional African garb and then wonder why he always had beef with the Edomite boss all the time. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, look, you could do it. You know, you want to, but is that really where you want to make your stand? You know what I'm saying? Like, is that really where you want to make your statement? But my point is we have this casual thing. You got casual dress, right? I'm dealing with dress. You have casual relationships. Everything in the world is casual, right? And we're going to break that down a little bit, right? Dating by its very nature is a casual affair. There's no seriousness. There's no respect. There's no sanctity for what 
you're really trying to accomplish, right? You don't date for marriage anymore. You sow your oats, right? You you have fun. You taste. You try out, right? Baskin Robbins, 31 flavors. So, you, you know, some of you were so lewd, you had a damn list of everybody and every type of thing you wanted to try out. Casual. Casual dinners. Casual travels. On and on. Hell, even marriages. Absent of the proper understanding in the scriptures, casual nowadays, right? There's not enough respect given to proving a spouse, right? I had started going over that. We talk a lot about that on uh, the radio show. Comes up a lot. And the people seem to want it. You know, I've tried to branch to other topics, but people got questions, people got comments. So obviously that the casualness that we have is a problem. And guess what? The casualness creeps into how you handle this truth as well. And you build this deception up in yourself of you being committed to this and you're actually deceiving your own self of how you do it. Now, you would say, okay, casual doesn't seem like such a strong word. Let's look up the definition, right? Let's look up the definition. Uh, are you ready to read? Yes, sir. Yeah, you good? Yes, sir. I, I was trying to give you time to overcome Bro, he looked shell shocked after after his prayer. I said, "Damn! If I have him start reading now, he's gonna." All right, go ahead. Come on, read this definition. Casual, relaxed, and unconcerned. Relaxed and unconcerned. It, it's it's defined by a lack of seriousness. Jump down to the uh, noun one. A person who does something irregularly. Oh, so inconsistent. Can we open up similar on the adjective one? Let's see. Go ahead. Read those similar. Relaxed, friendly, natural, informal, unceremonious. Unceremonious. That, that highlights itself in how many of us treat the feast days, the uh, order of uniform and structure. Go ahead. Come on. Unpretentious. Easy going, free and easy, uninhibited. Ooh, uninhibited. Well, that's what that's the thing with relationships that I was talking about. Uninhibited, right? Uh, what else you got? I think I said I, not just Google, right? I gave you the specific ones of that I wanted to bring up. I gave you the specific ones, right? Okay, I said Webster too. All right, let's read these. Subject to resulting from or occurring by uh, chance. Okay, no, go keep reading. Occurring without regularity. Occasional. Occasional. Jump down to number three. Feeling or showing little concern. Nonchalant. Nonchalant, right? Little concern. Next one. Lacking a high degree of interest or devotion. Read the next one. Done with serious intent. Without? Without serious intent. Or commitment. And what's the example they give? Casual sex. Right. And here's the thing. Casual, you know, words have connotations. If you don't know what a connotation is, it means there's a association of a feeling behind the word. Right? So if I call you ignorant, you're offended by that. But the definition of ignorant means just you might not have been exposed to that understanding or that knowledge. But it sounds strong, right? And we've used it in such manners that it has a negative connotation. Casual has a positive connotation nowadays. Sounds like a good thing. That's why, but then you put it casual sex, understanding how important that is and what it represents in, in the framework of a marriage and how we should be thinking, right? It just, it gives you a good vibe instead of just saying you're being hoey and promiscuous and you know, you're a whoremonger, right? No, 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 I just, just casual sex. It's just casual sex. And then let's read this one here, this next one. Informal, Na natural. Natural. Let's remember that, all right, for later. It says casual means natural, right? Natural. Now, it goes into many things, obviously, right, just such as the English language, right? It, it kind of loses its potency, with how many the definitions mean something, so on and so forth, right? But really, what we can sum up from this is it's a lack of emotional commitment, it's a lack of seriousness, 
And it's also a lack of loyalty when you really dive down and reflect on that, right? It's characterized by a superficial involvement. And what that means is that you look like you're there. You might even be physically present. You might even look like you're involved. But it's superficial because it lacks that commitment. It lacks the seriousness to you, right? And it's really a self-serving and self-centered state of mind. Think about it. I can do this and that for the Lord, but only if I don't have to be uncomfortable in doing so, right? If it fits my schedule, does it fulfill my agenda of what I want accomplished? Oh, you know what? Am I going to get exposure by doing this? Are people going to recognize me by me helping out with this event or that? And then you got a lot of people who just do things in the background with their nose to the grindstone that don't care about none of that. But the big one is the one that it, it amazes me how casual people are when it comes into the perspective of does it fit my schedule. Nobody wants to be uncomfortable. right? I've heard some wild excuses for why people don't come to stuff. I'm not even going to get with the sisters, but brothers. Oh, why you can't make it to the mission? Oh, man, I got off real late. I'm just feeling so tired. Man, you can't just try to, you know, just can't bang it out for a couple hours like a two-hour fly mission. You can't You can't just come up with that? I, uh, that earpiece sound like a hell of a, mic, a speaker, bro. Like it's killing me. <laughs> it's loud as hell. I don't know how your eardrums ain't blown out. I'm sorry. It's just, I'm trying to ignore it, but I keep hearing the, Communication. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? All right. Anyway, let me get Micah four and ten. Get Micah four and ten. So we 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 we're, we're trying to meditate on this casualness, right? I want to put this in your head, and and time permitting, we'll move into a segment where we'll show how you're easily deceived into being comfortable enough, being casual enough in thinking that you're all right. A lot of you confuse attendance with salvation. A lot of you confuse attendance with salvation. In its own subtle way, you think your butt in a seat here means you've made it. And your actions, you move in that way. You're presumptuous in how you deal with things. Your casualness shows out to those who are aware of it, to those who aren't tuned for it. Let's read this real quick, Micah 4 and 10. The book of Micah, chapter 4, verse 10. Remember, I said it's summed up in saying that it's lack of loyalty, lack of seriousness, seriousness and it's really a self-serving and self-centered state of mind, Right? So what I'm trying to do is key you into understanding casualness as how it's going to manifest here in the truth. And one of those things comes with how you move in this respect. The scripture says this. Go ahead. Come on. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion. Right. It's letting you know that it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a painful thing to be able to really commit to this. Man, I, I, I'm telling you, I've seen all types of reasons why people are dropping out of offices and all this other stuff. Hell, you got people that walk away from rank. And not because there's some serious thing that maybe needs to be cleared up, but just, oh, I, I can't manage, I can't deal, it's too much work. Think of Tabernacles, we had a conversation with a brother like that. Read it from the top again. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion. Right, so it's letting you know that in order to be in this walk, that you're going to have to bring forth progress and that it's not always going to be simple. That door closed after Eve caused Adam to sin, right? Because remember, the sin started with her, and then Adam in his simpleness went after the woman, right, to, to please her, he accepting of what she was bringing to him. And that, that, those ways of immortality, you read that in Ezra's, I believe, it says uh, the elder world, it was wide and sure, but now it's narrow and filled with much travail. 
So the opportunity for this to be a walk in the park, that left thousands upon thousands of years ago. And now by the sweat of our brow, in pain and labor, but then somehow we forget that when we come in here. And I'm talking about some people that have sat here for years. I'm talking about five years plus. Five years plus in this, and you're still rolling in a casual spirit. No growth, no type of development, your name always coming up and stuff. Uh, Deacon uh, Abiel was going over great class last week. If you didn't catch it, if you didn't pay, I would go back to it. And he was talking about that. You, you're the common denominator, but somehow it's everybody else. Never stopping to say, why the hell is my name always in the midst of this stuff? There, it's not anybody else then, it's you. Once or twice, maybe you can play with that and say, ah, eh, you know. Man, when you're on your like 15th or 20th offense, what are you really doing? Where's your seriousness in trying to change and grow? Go ahead, read on. Like a woman in travail, for now shalt thou go forth out of the city. Right, so like a woman in travail is talking about in the labors, right? And labors have contractions. So what it means is that there will be some times where there's relief, where it's not painful, right? But then when those contractions come and those labor pains come, there's going to be struggle to be in this. There's going to be struggle to be in this. Go ahead, come on. And thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the land, from the hand of thine enemy. And the other part I want to look at this is that it's letting you know. Micah here, the prophet, was telling them, because you're in captivity now, it's going to be difficult for you to be able to serve the Lord. Yes, he's going to give us grace and peace with our enemies, but he's letting you know that you must do it in the midst of that. And that was captivity, captivity. That's not the captivity that we talk about now when you're like, oh, I got to go to my job. I got to be there at 6 o'clock. Captivity. I got to go to captivity. Yeah, we say that. We say it's captivity. Especially if you got a job that you just can't stand. But that's not real captivity. If you're having problems with your casualness in this walk, just put into perspective what the forefathers had to do to serve the Lord. Remember, they had to hide in caves to keep the Sabbath day at one time. Here, you got a beautiful school. We got air conditioning. We got fans. You got nice backdrops and decorations. You got comfortable chairs. You get refreshments in the back. Some schools just be feeding people, feeding people. They come for the food. And we have a great congregation. You feed everybody. So of course they're coming for that. Remember, we had to stop that a while back and just made it for the men that go out. You coming from your damn house and you want a free lunch here? Soup kitchen mentality. You coming literally from your home to the school. I'm, I'm not talking about the men that go out. That's why we had to change that. The lunch is for the men that go out. Because they're leaving early in the morning. They're going out. Depending on where you're at, you're doing hours of camp. So you're going from there to the school so that you can then attend the Sabbath class and learn. So all right. So we, we, we provide a little something for people. But some people, that's all it is. You want to feed your bellies. So this was in captivity. This was in Babylon. He said, even in Babylon, right? There's where you're going to be delivered. So what's that mean? That's where you got to be able to fulfill the righteous acts. Let's get 1 Kings 8 and 47. What I'm trying to show you is that your job, your kids, your husband, your wife, whatever issue that you use to not be on fire for the Lord, is nothing compared to being in actual captivity, in literal captivity. Here we got some ease to be able to serve the Lord. You see that with all these knuckleheads that don't go out on the street, they just stay behind a computer and think that they're doing something. That's another sec. That, like I said, the ca I, I'm not going to be able to cover all the casual types today. That's another type of casual. Lord says go out to the highways and hedges. And they want to say the highways and hedges is the information superhighway. It's the internet. Uh, 
Scripture says, be in pain and labor to bring forth. And he said, listen, to our forefathers, you were going to do this in captivity. You were going to do this in captivity. Real captivity under Babylon, under Assyria, under the Persian Medes, under the Greeks, under the Romans. You saw how it was under the Greeks. You couldn't profess yourself to be a Jew at all. They would make you come and worship their festivals, their days. And then now some of you got this mentality that, like, it's just so hard to serve the Lord. What's difficult is the internal conflict you might have from your own lust. But there should be no outside influence because this is not hard times. This is not real tribulation. That's called being under the curses. And we have a lighter version of it right now. Go ahead, read this. Come on. The book of 1 Kings, chapter 8, verse 47. Yet, if they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried away captive. Again, so in Micah we read, he talks about when y'all were in Babylon. Here he says, in the land whither you were carried captives. Captives. In bondage. Being told where you can go, when you can go. Yeah, there's certain manifestations of that. It's not the same, especially not here in America, especially not here in the United States, the U.S. of A. I was thinking the other day about uh, people who come up in poverty. And uh, I, as Deacon Lava was talking about welfare. And stuff. I grew up on welfare and all that stuff. I remember I used to be embarrassed to go with the food stamps to the supermarket because the girl was cute, the cashier. And I didn't want her to see me paying because it was the coupon book we had there, right? It was the fake money Brown. they made. You know, yeah. and you had the different ones, right? right? Yeah. So you had to, so my mom would, you know, and she wouldn't send me with the whole book because, you know, you lose it, yeah. then you're done. So she would rip out. It had a perforated line, yeah. right? And you would go with the, be like, damn, I don't want to go with the food stamps to the store. The cashier is cute. I don't want to be there paying with food stamps. I'm embarrassed by that. Get a couple smacks in my face. You better freaking go, and then I would have to go, right? That's That's nothing. If anything, we were being given something. Yeah, it created a dependency and everything else for our people. It, it took the place of uh, the divine order of a marriage and a husband that was a provider in the house and all of that stuff. right? But my point is that's not even real captivity. So I was thinking about the poverty, and I'm like, man, here in the USA, we got it super twisted over here. Especially as you travel, when you really start to travel. I'm not talking about you brothers that, you know, just go, that dip a toe over the border. I mean, all praises, you're doing that, right? I'm not talking about dip a toe over the border for a day. I'm talking about where you get to go and see. You see the poverty, you see the struggles of our people in other places. And you realize poverty here in the United States, though it's poverty, it's not the same poverty as it is in other countries. It's not the same poverty as in Haiti. It's not the same poverty as in Africa. It's not the same poverty that's in Cuba or in Central and South America, depending on where you're at. It's different. And their struggle is they would love to be poor in the United States. Not even rich. They would love to come here and be poor in the United States. Right? Go, uh, go ahead, read, read on. Read it from the top. Verse 47. Yet, if they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captives, and repent, and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned and have done perversely. We have committed wickedness. Right. So all these things which we do, which we teach, they were doing in captivity. Let me get Second Maccabees 15, 17. Want to bring this out? Because we were talking about the Greeks, right? Second Maccabees 15 and 17. The book of First Maccabees, chapter 15, verse 17. I, you, I said second. Second Maccabees, chapter 15. You're doing all right, man. Don't. I'm trying not to give you a hard time when you make a little. It's like I said, you looked shell shocked after. Come on. We read the book of 2 Maccabees, chapter 15, verse 17. Thus, being well comforted by the words of Judas, which were very good and able to stir them up to valor and to encourage the hearts of the young men. And we follow in those same footsteps. Everything we do and everything we set up is to encourage the hearts 
of the young men. Go ahead, come on. They determined not to pitch camp, but courageously to set upon them and manfully to try the matter by conflict because the city and the sanctuary and the temple were in danger. Right, so they were committed to fight. They were committed to do what was necessary to serve the Lord. Remember when it said they saw the abomination of desolation and they were sacrificing swine's flesh on the altar? It drove those who were in righteousness mad, literally angry, and it fired them up. Go ahead, read on. Verse 18, for the care that they took for their wives and their children, their brethren and kinsfolk was at least the count with them. But the greatest and principal fear was for the holy temple. Right, that goes into... He said, look, it said the wife, the kids, none of that. Not, it didn't say that they didn't matter. It said that that was the least. And this was at time with war with the Greeks. In captivity under the Greeks, at war with the Greeks. And they fought to be able to keep God's covenant. And here we are. Oh, I can't make it because, uh, you know, I, I worked the twelve. I worked the 12, we were jacked up. I'm, uh, uh, oh, you know, uh, I gotta work Sabbaths. Ooh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Let me not digress. Let's jump back to where we were. First Kings 8 and 48. The book of First Kings. captivity, I gotta work the Sabbath. I'm gonna deal with that in a second. Go ahead, come on. Chapter 8, verse 48. And so, return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for my right, thy so name. Right, so it says return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul. Not half-hearted, not, not casually. Remember, casual was uh, natural, lack of devotion, lack of commitment. It says when we return... It's not checking off a checklist. It says, with all your heart and all your soul. Like we just read in Maccabees, it said even their families in that thing were not as much as a priority. Because you know why? Because some people sitting here, you got women, especially. You got the simp brothers. Right? That's, that's oh, but my wife and kids. It's not saying that they disregard is that if the, the temple and all of that was lost, and clearly you see the results of it today, they understood that what they had with their family and their wife and kids wouldn't be there anyway, that that would be in jeopardy. I'll give you an example of that. If they were more concerned with defending their family than defending the gospel and the temple and all that that stood for, uh, I'll give you an example when I was in the military. I worked in fuel systems on the aircraft. And during times of conflict, you don't have time to actually go into the, because uh, if you don't know, an airplane, the fuel is in the actual body of the plane, right? So uh, depending on which aircraft it is, right? Uh, some of them have bladders, some of it is just in the fuselage and in the wings, right? And they spring leaks all the time air pressure and everything like that. They always leaking, right? So it, it was basically a glorified plumber. But what they did was you had to take this little putty in times of conflict, and all you did was find where the leak was, and you put this putty there. But what they teach you is that when you had downtime where you could down an aircraft, you had to drain it out, you had to go in there, and you had to find the source of that leak. Because all you were doing was patching where it was coming out from. But you still had an issue where it wasn't running where it needed to run, right? And I use that to say the example of the, of the kids in the temple. They understood that, okay, I might win for a day and protect my family for a day. I might protect them for a time. But if I don't stand for God and the temple and all of that, then none of this matters because I will lose this and that. So what you have to do is find the thing that's the higher priority that will give you the result and the victory for the whole thing. That's why 
us as leadership have been bringing things out where we're trying to put you in a frame of mind to prepare you for when things get worse. Where is that where Christ said after that many left him? Can you get that for me? Because when that time happens, you're going to see, you know, because everybody gets all excited with numbers. Oh, look at how many people we had here and there. Right? But he tells them after, will you go also? Right? So he tells them, when the tribulation gets harder and tougher, those who don't receive that edification and that building up that's been coming out to prepare yourself for that, those are the ones that's going to leave. And it's going to be made manifest that your thing was casual. We're going to go into that later about when tribulations, persecution for the word's sake. We're going to go into that later, okay? You got it? Yes, sir. Give me that. The book of St. John, chapter 6, verse 66. Uh huh. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye go away? Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Right, and that's the mentality that we have to have. So after Christ was bringing certain things out, a lot of them said, man, this guy, some of you, as some of this stuff has been coming out, us trying to elevate the understanding of death and what's in store for us at the end of that, uh, bringing out different things in different ways, stuff that you're seeing being manifest in the earth. Some of you right now are wavering with what's happening and what you're seeing. And you're more concerned with the woe is me of your day-to-day -day life than you are with what God has called you for. Because many are called, but few are chosen. And I think we forget that part. And this goes back to where I said, because you think you have a seat here, you get comfortable, you lack commitment, you lack devotion, you lack loyalty. Now, I don't even mean loyalty to us and, and, and IUIC. I'm talking about loyalty to the king, to the father. And you deceive yourself into believing that you do. Go ahead. Come on. Read on. Verse 49. Verse first Kings. Yep. I'm Book sorry. Yeah. First the book Kings of 1 Kings, Sorry. chapter 8, verse 49. Mm -hmm. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. And forgive thy people that have sinned against thee, and all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee. And give them compassion before them who carried them captive. Right, so now he says, if you do this with all your heart and soul in captivity in distress, in pain, I'm going to open up a doorway where your captors will give you ease. It says, and give them compassion before them who carried them. The compassion that he's given us is this opportunity for us to go out and preach so boldly and confidently. This opportunity for us to hit these other countries, wherever our people are scattered, to go out and up until now allow us to return safely from these things. You're going to see when some of us start to die for this, when they start to actually get to that point where they lock you up for preaching this, when the time comes where you won't have this platform to be taught, who is a real believer, who has de been deceiving themselves, and who is casual about their walk and their faith. Go ahead, come on. That they may have compassion on them, verse 51. For they... Be thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of iron. Come on. That thine eyes may be open unto the supplication of thy servant and unto the supplication of thy people Israel to hearken unto them in all that they call for unto thee. Right. And that hearken unto them for all that they call to thee, that don't mean that you're praying so that you can make your car payment, you're praying for rent money or the job. The hearken unto us and all. It, it's going into the kingdom and rulership because everything that drives us should be what his plan is because you can't do nothing against the truth but for it. I'm not saying you don't pray for those things, but a lot of times we water down some of the potency of some of these scriptures. And you'll read that and you'll say, oh, and he'll hearken unto them and all that they call for unto thee. Yeah, 
The scripture says if our ways are pleasing to him, he'll grant us the desires of our heart. But what should be the chief desire of our heart? Like we read in Maccabees was that temple, right? And at that time it was, doesn't mean the building. It's just everything that that represented as far as us as a nation. This needs to be the apple of your eye. And it's astounding to me how many people don't treat it that way. See, this is why we get angry when stuff comes up. I don't want to say that we could care less about the individual. It really depends. And we're kind of built up and prepared. Sometimes I, sometimes I still marvel at stuff. I think uh, Shia was asking me last week. We're talking about somebody. He's like, damn, but why are you so, like, the behavior pattern is what it is. Like, it's not like it's ever changed. I said, you know what? You're right. I said, I just think I, I focus on the aspects of where your mind can go and be, that you can be that way, that you can be so casual. And it's scary to me from a respectful thing because I know anything that we know is because the Lord gave it to us. And just like he gave it to us, he can take it away, right? You read that in Romans 1. He said, because you didn't want to retain God in your knowledge, I've given you over to a reprobate mind. Meaning that we only have sufficiency of this understanding because he keeps that doorway open. He keeps that light on us to stay that way. That opportunity is there to continue to build ourselves on our faith in our studies. But when he's ready to close that on you, when he sees like you re like there's nothing left in you, now you see that descent. And that's what gets me in a state of mind that I'm like, I can marvel at that. And with Christ, it was different because he was doing miracles and everything like that. And people still walked away from him. So it's not that, you know, because who are we? Well, we're not over here turning water into wine and feeding y'all with, you know, a few loaves of bread and some fish. So, of course, people would walk away, right? We've always wanted a sign and this and that. But even that don't mean nothing. You got to find a devotion to this. That's beyond your own self-interest, but still be able to function in day-to-day -day society, which requires you to have self-interest. They just can't be higher than what this mission is and what you're called for. Let me get uh, Hebrews 11 and 14. Hebrews 11 and 14. The book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. So the such things that he's talking about is when you profess to follow this. We're not acting like we seek a country. We're acting like we want to maintain the state of this present world. Because when, when you're casual in your walk and your belief, and again, I, I mean, the list, if I, I started typing and I said, if I keep typing, I said, this isn't, you know, like, I, I can't, that's like, uh, you go to like a medical dictionary or like, a, or like the, uh, the psychology, I forgot what it's called, the psychology book that lists all the conditions and stuff like that, right? Uh, that, was it the ASA or something like that? Yeah. So you can't, you can't, um, Put that down there, right? That's not the aim of bringing that out. We're just going to touch on a few things. Because at the end of the day, you got to be able to self-examine and re and have a real honest reflection in yourself based on the scriptures. With the scriptures present, what manner of Israelite are you? Because everybody's strong when it comes to being Israel but we become weak when it becomes to the level of devotion. I mean, uh, Paul calls it your fellow prisoner. Christ said, take my yoke. It's, it's a righteous form of captivity to the Father in Christ. And we don't move in that spirit. We don't operate that way. Uh, read this from the top again. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out. Right, so it says plainly we seek a country. Plainly we seek a country. Jump up, actually. Read verse 13. Verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, 
but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Right. So it says they were persuaded. They were convinced of what they read. Not casual, they were convinced. And it says they embraced them. How do you embrace something that's intangible? Because you think embrace, and you think embrace means what? Touch it, hug it, right? Let's get that definition of embrace. Embrace. Hold someone closely in one's arms. Right, that's what we go to right away. That's what you think of, right? Go ahead. Especially as a sign of affection. Uh Uh-huh. Number two. Wait, wh- where did I, s- I said I wanted Google. Did I have Embrace up or no? Oh, just Google. Okay. I want you to jump to the noun. No, jump to number two in verb and number two in noun. Go ahead. Come on. Number two, verb. Accept or support a belief, theory, or change willingly. Willingly? Come and, on. And enthusiastically. Willingly and enthusiastically. Willingly and enthusiastically, meaning not casually. To embrace it is the opposite of that. When it says embrace it, it means in your mind. It means in your blood. It means in your spirit that you hold on to that thing. And I understand that that doesn't happen right away. Uh, I had a teacher of mine in Krav Maga, and he says, uh, self-defense, and he says, when you start training, it's largely here. Meaning it's very technical, right? You're very, there's a lot of curiosity. There's a lot of trying to learn. And you want to strive for that mastery. But it takes years of application to obtain mastery. And the, and the challenging thing with, this, with these scriptures is that it's so powerful, the little that we're shown that it puffs you up to think that you're somebody and to believe that you have mastery. And real mastery breeds devotion and commitment. It breeds passion. As leadership, we talk about you got boring teachers. You got people that bring this stuff out, and their hearts are not on fire with this stuff. How could you not be excited when these things come out? Because you're still up here. It's just a process for you, right? And that's the same thing when the self-defense. And you see somebody and their moves are blocky. They're not instinctive. They're trying to memorize. They're looking for, oh, is that the angle that he's going to strike me at? Is this the way I do it? But when you've graduated to mastery, you just react. It becomes in you, right? So when you embrace it, it's the opposite of being casual. I'll give you an example. Some of you are only here for rod and box. Right? Some of you are only here because, well, I'll say spouses, right? Because that's, <laughs> that's the only way that you can get any of those under God, right? You're only going to get rod and box, right, <laughs> in a marriage. But you guys are casual about the marriage piece of it. But some of you really only, because you're like, okay, I know enough well, let me, that, that outside I ain't going to get nothing good. But at least here, you see, y'all just, it's such an exchange of Christianity for being an Israelite. Because what they tell you, you want to get some, you want the good girls, you get them in church, right? I mean, knowing what we know now, that ain't always the case, right? (laughs) Some of the worst ones is in church. Those churches, right? But some of you are here for that rod and box. And that's casual, too. Because, again, your your apple of your eye, your commitment is not not these scriptures, right? Um, So... To embrace it, read the uh, next one. I'm sorry, I want the similar in two. That's what I wanted, not the verb. In two. Read the similar. Go ahead, come on. Welcome. Accept. Take up. Take up. Like take up arms to fight. Take up the calling that we've been called for. And be fervent on it. We're going to talk about fervency later. We're not just required to keep these laws. We're not just required to come here and fill a seat and do these things. We're required to be fervent about it. You remember, we went into captivity because why? Let's get the uh, Deuteronomy 28, 
Is it like 46? We said, because you didn't with joyfulness and gladness of heart. Right, get me that. Because it wasn't done with joyfulness and gladness of heart. But when you see it, man, there's some congregations. I've not come back to visit them because they sap the life out my soul. You sit there and it's like, I mean, and we send men to them. I'm just saying I haven't gone because it's just dead. It's a dead spirit. Some of them are weird. And I know people be like, yo, you know, I've told them. It's not like I don't tell them to the face. I've told them. And they're like, well, what do you mean that is weird? What do you mean that we weird? And I give some examples, but there's something spirit like you could tell, like, it's like, where's the life in this place? It makes me depressed. I got to wait till I land back here, and then I'm like, oh, I'm all right. I, I made it. <laughs> Go ahead. What did I tell you to get? Deuteronomy. Go ahead, get that. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verse 47. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God, with joyfulness and with gladness of heart. With joyfulness and gladness of heart. Enthusiastically. Willingly. That it in that verse? For the abundance of all things. Right. Remember, I, I said earlier at the end of where it says, hearken unto us in all that we ask of him. The abundance of all things is immortality, eternal life, and rulership. Ultimate rulership. Go ahead, come on. Verse 48. Oh, no, that's it. That's all I wanted on that. So enthusiastically, willingly to take up. Let's go back. Let's read a few more of the similar on the screen. Come on. Number two. Similar. Welcome, accept, take up. Take to one's heart. To embrace it. Take to one's heart. And like I said, the analogy I gave was the crowd of God. So it starts here, right? And then as you, and, and mind you, this is a process of time. And as you apply, right, it becomes into your blood, right? It becomes something that's kind of almost second nature. But true mastery is when it gets into your heart. And what I mean in your heart in this case, I'm talking about it's in your soul. Like it becomes your identity. It's not a part-time thing. It's, it's everything that you are. I've said this before. I don't know who I would be without this Bible. I mean, I have an idea because I knew who I was. But I can't imagine the emptiness I would have. But some of you aren't on that frame. Some of you don't move in that, because you see it in how all of this is secondary to everything else and everyone else in your life. And it only manifests itself as secondary when you have to make a choice between those things and this. And that's when that comes up. And that's when you'll see if you're really about this. I've spoke about the Sabbath sickness. I said, you should be joyful to come to the Sabbath every Sabbath. And it's unbelievable. I'm not talking about real sickness. I'm talking about it's unbelievable to. See, I don't want to give, I don't want to give this. Well, you can still tell if they're full of crap. I'll give you an example of somebody who's full of crap when they don't come. I'm not feeling well. Versus they tell you the symptoms they got. When you say you're not feeling well, it's like, damn, I don't want to lie. Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, especially with words. Don't play with me with words. My mom made me read dictionaries and encycl and I don't mean on Google. I had an encyclopedia and dictionaries that I would sit in the hallway and, and read, okay? You're not going to wordplay me, at least not in English. <laughs> at least not in my mastery of the English language is, is, is very strong, okay? It's very verbose. <laughs> Damn. Got him. See what I did there? <laughs> it's very verbose. I s you read between the lines of what people say, and you see that they're full of crap. So to embrace it means you commit to doing your end. You bring that into fruition, right? You make it a reality. Uh, let me give you another example of embracing. You remember that movie, The Hurricane, with Denzel Washington, right? And there's a scene where he talks about being locked up, and he says, I have to embrace this, right? Because when they were trying to get him out, he says, you guys are messing me up. You're giving me so much hope. 
that, you know, and then his appeals were getting, re- it looked like he wasn't going to get out because his appeals kept getting rejected and stuff like that, right? And he says, in order for me to do the time, I got to disconnect from all this other stuff and focus on what I'm doing here. I got to become this. This has to become my reality. And many of us have not embraced that as our reality. You're still doing something here where you don't accept that there's there's only one end for us. And I put that with a little asterisk. The only end for us is death and death. But is it the death that is the seed that changes to your true form and eternal life, the incorruptible, or is it that eternal permanent death and affliction of your soul, the second death? And that's the only end for anybody in all creation. Death and resurrection or death and death. So that's what you have to grab onto. That's what you have to, and and you cannot let the distractions of this place pull you in any other direction. And a lot of you are walking around with that deception in your heart. And no, the number of Sabbaths you have attended doesn't count for much. Scripture talks about those that sit amongst us and they're clouds without water, right? So that was the thing with the hurricane, right? Now, go back to Hebrews, read 13 through 15. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Right, so our aim is to either receive them afar off and die in faith, right? See them afar off and die in faith. And they were persuaded of them and embraced them. And confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, I've gone over this. I think I did a class some years back about being strangers and pilgrims in the earth. And it doesn't just mean a confession with your mouth. God is a God of action. By actions are we weighed. You have to move. When you say you confess that you are a stranger and a pilgrim in the earth, I'll give you the example that he gives here. Abraham. I, I, I love that one example. Abraham's faith was so strong and his devotion was to God so much, far from casual, that God says, sacrifice your son, knowing that he said, but in his seed is where the promises that I made to you will be fulfilled. But now, God, you're telling me to kill him? But without hesitation, you don't read that he said, why, God? What are you going to do to replace him? None of that. He offered him up because he understood the power that he served and the promise that was made and the incorruptibleness that there is in the one true God. And he said to himself, I got to imagine, well, whether I kill him or, or I don't. God is going to make this happen the way it needs to happen. So he had no qualms with that. He wasn't like, oh, my son, my son. Not in any way, shape, or form. And as you read this whole chapter, we're not going to do it now. It gives you all those examples of the depths of that. Our faith is small. And I mean smaller than the grain of a mustard seed because Christ said if it was just like the grain of a mustard seed, you could move mountains. Many of us, our faith is small compared to the things that the examples that he gave of our forefathers and the display of their faith that they had. But some of you in your lack of humility and your pomp will sit here and feel like you're on fire for this truth. But you're casual in how you move. This is something that can be taken away at any time. And I think if you think of it that way, you'll treat it more preciously like it should be. Right? Go ahead, read on. Verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Right. So what you're saying is that I know that I'm striving for the outside. Just like the example of the hurricane I gave. He started to get hopeful about the outside, but he said, but I, in order for that to happen, because he thought his only way out was going to be that he served his sentence. Right? And he said, you're messing me up. I can't, I can't hold on to this, and I keep getting rejected, and I keep getting turned down. 
But the difference is, is that we know what's at the end. We can have that confidence and say that boldly. Because we saw the example of Christ being resurrected. So you can't sit here and say, no, there's no way that he's not going to raise me back up if I do all that's required of him. The resurrection of Christ is one of the greatest miracles that was ever done in the earth. And that was one body. Can you imagine when the 144, the thousands of Israel are raised up and resurrected? So it should inspire us. So Christianity got you. Oh, it's the blood of Jesus. They're so focused. I've said this before. They're so focused on the death. They worship his death, not his resurrection. Don't get it twisted. Really examine what Christianity is about. They worship his death. And, and it's not even the real Christ. They worship Caesar Borgia's death. But if you just look at it on the surface of their understanding, I mean, you know this. You were in that Edomite church, mega church. That is correct, right? You were in that Edomite mega church all them years. Gam, too. Look, he looking and he's like, damn, I was too. You're right, yeah. Very actively involved, enthusiastic, right? Uh huh. Y'all was shucking jive in the Christian church, and then some of y'all come in here like, Right, he was slapping the bass like <laughs> with tears in his eyes for the Lord. Right? <laughs> read on, read on. Verse 15, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Right, and it says if we'd have been mindful, we'd have had opportunity to return. Meaning always embracing it, having it present of those promises. Remember, it, the, the scripture talks about he'll shorten the days. Meaning, it's not so much that there's an actual set number of years that the Lord wants something to go on. It's not really measured by time. It's not like he has in his head 100 and that's it, right? At least from what we understand and what we read, nobody knows the time or the hour. But the scripture teaches us that he's waiting till his set number is sealed. So it's not that he's saying, okay, in 100 years, this is what's going to happen. He said, when the 144,000 are sealed, then I unleash it. So what happens is, the more we strive for that, the more we obtain for what he wants, the quicker the end of all this will come. And that other country, that better country, which is really a kingdom, will manifest itself. Let's get Judges 5 and 11. Judges 5 and 11. The book of Judges, chapter 5, verse 11. Remember, we're still dealing with the casualness of everything. Go ahead, come on. They that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water. In our captivity, because again, back to that, all the excuses why we don't serve, why we have issues, why everything is so complicated to get done. Go ahead, come on. There shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. In captivity. In captivity. They were in real hard bondage. And here you got air conditioning. You got a heater. You got running water. I know I'm like, oh, what are you talking about running water? There's places that we go and visit that they don't got no running water. And if they do, it's only cold. Not even hot. You got a nice water heater that warmed that thing up. You could put toilet paper in your toilet and flush it. And we go to Central South America, you got to throw the toilet paper in the trash can. You can't throw it in the toilet. Man, you got toilet seats. There's bathrooms we go to when we are on mission, and they ain't got toilet seats. They just got the cold ceramic bowl. I'm losing those little things because the things that we think are hard are little things too. That's not a big deal. It's not. Yet here we are, not on fire, not devoted, casual in all our means. So for a lot of y'all, God is something you do. We have been groomed with a church mentality according to the world, and we don't realize how easily we bring that into this walk. You exchange Sunday for Saturday. You exchange identifying as a Christian for an Israelite, and you even dress the part. 
but your heart is far from him. Because, right, you sure would wear your Sunday best, they would talk about, right? Let me get Matthew 15 and 7. I'm just laying the foundation of the casualness, having gotten into the other parts that I want to bring out. Matthew 15 and 7. The book of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 7. Ye hypocrites, well did Esau as prophesy of you. Hypocrites, frauds, counterfeits. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you. Come on. Saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You know what? The, let me show you just one aspect of the deception. You read this, and because you're here with fringes and a border of blue and a head cover, you think this means your brothers and sisters who have not repented out in the world. You think it's the ones that are still in the Christian church. But he was quite literally speaking to the Pharisees who wore fringes and a border of blue, who the women wore their head covers and their uniform, who attended Sabbath, and at that time the sacrifices and all that other stuff, letting you know that this is addressed to people in the body. But do you see, do you see how we can just take that with the presumptiveness and automatically presume that's not me? He's talking about Israelites that are actually keeping laws. And he says, a lot of you are going to honor me with that lip service, but you're not going to embrace, you're not going to confess that you're strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Right? Let's get 2 Timothy 3 and 1. So the deception is that you're there and you read that and you automatically think, that it's not talking about people in here. And he's letting you know who is the subject matter there. He's talking to Israelites. Go ahead, come on. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of them their own self. What did I say? Casual, and the definition of it, is a self-serving, self-centered spirit. It's a self-serving, self-centered behavior pattern where yourself is above the Lord and anything else. So the scripture has prophesied to us that you will see this manifestation in these last days, that they're lovers of themselves. Go ahead, come on. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent. Hey, and let me tell you, that without natural affection, that's everybody that's always in conflict. You don't esteem others better than yourself. This is why there's always schisms in the body. The ones that sow discord, that disquiet friends. The list goes on, and we just dealt with that last weekend. Go ahead, come on. Fierce, despisers of those that are good. Read. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure. Hey, look at that. I said those are the same type that are traitors. Remember I said, as things heat up, you're going to see people leave. That's why it's laughable uh, of the traitors that we talk about that left some years back. It's laughable because of what they seemingly were offended by and left. And again, the offense was just an excuse. But that's what happens when you don't have your eye and your mind and your heart where it needs to be. Go ahead, come on. We're going to read down to seven. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. Having a form of godliness. Fringes, border of blue. Hell, you might have offices. You might be involved in things. Some of you might even be teachers. You have a form of godliness, meaning outwardly it appears so. Go ahead, come on. But denying the power thereof. Right. Denying the power thereof and letting the understanding roll over you, to, f to, to level yourself up to be more acceptable for, Lord, for the Lord. Go ahead, come on. From such, turn away. It says, from those type, don't deal with them. It says, from such, turn away. And you know what that means? 
It don't mean that we even look for you to put you out. That'll manifest itself when the time comes. You're either going to leave on your own or some sin's going to come into play where you have to be put out. What it means is that nobody's going to waste their effort on you. Remember in the corporate world, they tell you, focus your area on the team members that show the most potential and the willingness to do something with what you're giving them, what you're showing them. The ones that don't, you just kind of, all right, you're here, okay. I'm cordial, I'm civil, shalom, most high Christ, best more on, and so on. And you just leave them be. But you don't waste your time, right, trying to drag them to the finish line. Nobody should have to. This is treasure. This is pure gold. There's nothing more precious than the wisdom that comes from these scriptures. Nothing. If you got to drag somebody to that, that's a casual, that is a deceived person. Leave them alone. Go ahead, come on. Verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Right, and then you got the other sort that they'll actually be in there. You got the backdoor marriages. They deal with these sisters, right? I tell you, a lot of times if, if somebody leave off some doctrine and stuff, they wind up, a gaggle of women wind up following them. You might have a few simp brothers that go with them, but a gaggle of women wind up following them in their simplicity. Go ahead, come on, verse 7. Ever learning. Ever learning. Remember this for when we go over some points later. Ever learning. You're here every Sabbath. Oh, I watch classes. I watch this show. I watch that class. I take these notes, if you even take notes at all. Ever learning, meaning years in this. Ever learning. Go ahead, come on. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And never able to come to that true knowledge. Spinning your wheels here. Yeah, you might be able to quote some precepts. You might have some good memory skills that you could say this, that, and the other. Yeah. Uh, Maybe, maybe you're even uh, able to parakeet dark sayings, right? Not that you really understand them, but you heard someone else say them. So now you run around saying all that. But then you deal with some simple matters on why you ain't involved in the body. Why, haven't, why, why did you uh, give up your rank? And you get all types of nonsense coming out of it. We've sat there. We've sat and had these conversations with people. But they, they're there trying to memorize stuff so they can sound deep. Ever learning and never being able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so what's off about this is that we are people that have always been do as I say and not as I do. We have always lusted after the other nations and their ways. And we are easily swayed if we don't have a root in Christ to be moved and to be tossed to and fro. And I mean a real root in that. A real understanding, because there's layers to understanding Christ. I mean, it, there's been so much learning that has come out to the depths of what our Lord and Savior represents and who he is and what his mission is and what he's going to accomplish. And people seemingly can grasp that, but then the basics of application in this are always thrown to the wayside. Doesn't make sense. So that's not real understanding. You're never really able to come to that knowledge of the truth. Think about what your kids are going to do based on what they see you do for you casual ones. Imagine you're raising your kids and you speak about the truth, right? You, you talk about being an Israelite and the laws and Christ, but what they see at home is a very different display of what you display here. What do you think they're going to grow up to be? It undermines and destroys their faith. Hell, even grown folk, it'll be like that. They'll be discouraged and undermined by seeing something like that. Because what they'll see is a bunch of people not doing what they do, not walking the walk, so to speak, right? So let me give you some examples of some casual behavior. If you're more excited about sports than something to do with the body or a mission, you might be a casual believer. 
I'll say that again because you got a lot of those. If you're more excited about sports, I use that one because that's a big one, than you are about something to do with the body or mission, you might be a casual believer. I'll give you an example. Oh, the Super Bowl's on. We might, let's say we're having an event at the school. No, nah, I'm not coming because I want to watch the Super Bowl. Right? Uh, if you're more excited about a movie or a restaurant than you are about a mission or real fellowship with the body, you might be a casual believer. Because you got those brothers that they'll show up to every outing. Right? You know, you do like the bowling, whatever, the family outing. Hey, hey brothers, we're going to go hit a restaurant. Instantly they're available and they can make it. It don't matter that they work the 12. It don't matter. None of that stuff. They in there. They in there. (laughs) They in there. Right? But then you say, oh, all right, we're doing this with the school. We got this mission coming up. We're doing this, that. And they not there? You might be a casual believer. I don't know. All right? Uh, If you can always show up to work, sick or not, but are always Sabbath sick to come here, you might be a casual believer. Oh, that's a big one. That's a big one. Oh, I can't make it. I can't make it. I'm not feeling well. But you were at work yesterday. So, so it, goes, it shows you where your devotion is. It shows you where your commitment is. That's that casualness, right? Uh, I'll give you another example. It's the same thing, all these behaviors. If you have a brother or sister that talks about health, right? We got a lot of those. Everybody got a great deal to say about healthy behavior and healthy eating. Right? And then you got one that actually goes to the gym or works out at home or whatever. You see the exercise. You see the discipline in their meals and all this other stuff like that. And ultimately, you see results. And then you got the ones that sound good talking about health or money. It could be finance, too. Man, you got so many people that got something to say about money and, and ideas. And then, like, when you don't receive the idea because there's no substance behind it, they all offended and stuff like that. Oh, you out the spirit. You're not. Right? Have you thought of everything else that it would take to bring that to fruition? And I'm not talking about the downers that's always trying to, you know, quench a spirit. But I'm talking about insincerity. That's why I use the health and the money, right? So there's no stability in their life. You got those people with the money. They're the ones that never got money, never done anything, have no experience in in any of that, right? So you got the healthy ones that talk about health, but they fat and always sick, right? And I'm not saying that's always indicative of unhealthiness, but, I mean, if you're always sick, something is up, right? And then you got the other ones that what? The money part. And they got no stability. They always from no in their own lives, no measure of success, not even modestly. Not that we hang our hat on that, but be quiet. Because if you've not been able to apply what you're telling me, then there's no value in it. It's just words. You got to be able to show me, right? Or say, hey, I gave this advice to this person and look what they were able to do with it, right? So you're going to notice and the ones that will stand out are the ones that you see results from whether it's finance, whether it's uh, uh, fitness, health, whatever it is. I tell you, there's a lot of uh, YouTube MDs, a lot of Instagram doctors here amongst the body. Take this herb, take this, this. Don't take this, take that. What have you studied? That you're going to be dishing out information like that. Right? It don't make no sense. So the ones you respect is the ones who you see the example. Intent means nothing in this walk. I'll say that again. Your intentions don't mean anything. It's your actions that demonstrate all, right? Let me get that in James where he says, show me my faith. I'll show you my faith by my works. Is that James 2? Get me that real quick. Get me that real quick. This is the book of James, chapter 2, verse 18. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Right, because you have people that'll be like, well, you can't tell me. You can't tell me where I stand in this, what my belief is like. Oh, yes, we certainly can, some of us. 
Some of us who can identify that, who have gone through the process and built ourselves up and continue to do so, showing up doesn't mean anything to me. Some of y'all show up to work and the boss just can't fire you because you're in a union. He knows you dragged the whole team down. All right? Show up. Go ahead, come on. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So you see results. It's demonstrable, okay? It's demonstrated. So you'll be able to see it. You can talk all you want and get offended all you want. You see. You know them by their fruits, right? Outside of that, you're a fraud. You're a counterfeit. You're a hypocrite like the scriptures say, right? So this highlights just some but not all encompassing list of deceived casual believers. Some more characteristics. You're indifferent to order and structure of how we have things in place. Our shirts literally say an organized nation on the back. An organized nation. You'll wear the shirt and be the most unorganized, self-serving, always got an excuse as to why things aren't done and why you can't be about it. Right? Let me get Titus 3 and 1. Titus 3 and 1. You're indifferent to order and structure. Well, then you're a casual believer because the scriptures goes on and on at length about teaching order and structure. You might be the whiners and complainers that, oh, I don't like the way uh, y'all do security and your process. I don't like the way y'all run in the kitchen. I don't like the way y'all clean the trash or the toilet bowls. And I'm not talking about outliers where stuff is not being done properly. But you just need to be, because the ones that will complain, it's not like it's people that actually bring anything or have brought anything of value. But you, the ones that are the most counterfeit, the ones that are the most casual have the most opinions. And you ever heard that, that saying, opinions are like assholes? Everybody has them and they all stink. Mine don't smell. But everybody. <laughs> no, you saw my man Leo Musty. Mine don't stink, all right? <laughs> but, right, everybody got them. You all, you're full of opinions. You, you, you always got an issue with anything that we do with order and structure. And listen, I know that sometimes Change is difficult, right? We don't like change, none of that. I mean, just in general, we don't like that. We're, as people, we like routine, we like habit, right? We function better when there's a flow, right? This is why I always get so mad when my wife moved my stuff from somewhere. I tell you, it could be 10 years from now. I'll remember where I need, what, where it is, and what I need it for when I need it. And she, oh, to this day, to this day, I'm trying to work on her on that. I'm, telling her she, I'm trying to show her that that's a form of rebellion. Till this day. And she's like, but I, oh, you, when you ask me, I find it. Yeah, I got to wait like 10 minutes, five minutes. I just want to be able to grab it. You know, you position stuff with a flow. We like a routine, right? We like a routine. But then you have, so I understand that. But then we're trying to build order. So we might say, well, look, we're not going to do this this way. We're going to do it this way now. Or we're going to try this out for a little bit and see how this works because we got to level up, right? Something's happening. Something's here. We need to, we need to adjust. We need to fix this. We need to fix that. And because your small mind, your small spirit, can't see the 10 moves ahead that we're thinking when we put something into place, all you do is complain. You bitch and moan, so to speak. Right? <laughs> Shut up. Man, y'all was late as hell with the beeps on the show, by the way. You let me say the damn word and then beep me after. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just thought about it with the beep. Titus 3 and 1, come on. The book of Titus, chapter 3, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities. Right, so we have to teach you to be subject to principalities. How are you going to be an organized nation in a kingdom that's going to have supreme order on a spiritual level that we've not seen in an experience and think that you're going to be able to live in that kingdom and be all right? Remember, it says we got to rehearse those things now in captivity. Rehearse those righteous acts. Bethink ourselves. Return to him with all our heart now. There ain't no excuse, because right, the mindset is, okay, when I get there, I'll do better. That's the same thing, like, when you were in the world, or you did New Year's resolutions, 
Hell, not even New Year's resolution. You wait till Monday. Okay, Monday, I'm going to start fresh. Monday, I'm going to start fresh. All right? Damn, I messed up my diet. Monday, I'm going to start fresh. Damn, I didn't do my budget. Monday, I'm going to start fresh. Next week, Monday, I'm going to start and, and get it going. And y'all treat, y'all, I'm telling you, you carry that stuff in to the next thing. Now you carry it. That's why I'm so obsessive, I think, to a point about talking about things where we change, where we perfect ourselves. Because this whole walk, this whole thing, is to, is to align ourselves with what the Lord always intended us to be. And when you go against that, you're going against God. But you don't see it that way. Okay, read this again. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities Come on. and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Second Peter 2 and 10. Because it builds order. It fosters order and structure so we can move more perfectly as a unit. Second Peter 2 and 10. The book of Second Peter, chapter 2, verse 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. And despise government. There's people amongst us that despise government. That's why anything that we do with order irks you. It vexes your spirit. We have accountability with the rank men. Oh, I can't make it. I can't make it to 101. I can't make it to MOV. I can't make You've been here too damn long to not post your reason. You know that. And in your selfishness, in your casualness, why are you trying to be a lord over me? Why are you trying to do this? We're trying to build responsibility. We're trying to put you back into a masculine frame of accountability. We're trying to level you up to the gods that we are. And you hear in your feelings whining and crying. I saw you putting something up. Was there something that I missed that I was supposed to put up? Or are you trying to cue me with something? I don't know. I saw something come up. All right? Read this again from the top. But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness uh -huh. and despise government. Presumptuous are they. Self-will. Self. That's really what it is. Because a lot of times you think of the extreme manifestation of self-will where somebody will do something totally against protocol. Just your resistance to order, just your resistance to protocol is a self-willed spirit. Because you'll say, well, I'm not, I've never done anything off. I still comply. The fact that you resisted is self-willed. Go ahead, come on. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignity. Titus 1 and 5. The book of Titus, chapter 1, verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldst set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city. Right. So order, order. You're reading all throughout while these churches were being established in all these different cities and countries that they said we must bring order. Read this from the top again. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldst set in order the things that are wanting. Elders go to city, experienced men. That by exercise of use have learned to discern from good and evil by practice and application to set things in order. Man, I remember when I first got here, y'all was staying in the school till 3 in the morning, eating chicken wings, ordering the $5 hot and ready's from Little Caesars, playing dominoes. And those of you that were here was salty as hell when I shut that down. Salty as, you think, see, just because you never got called up for it, you think I never heard the stuff y'all was saying about me and my wife because she was trying to help me set things in order on the sister's side. Y'all think I don't know the things y'all say? It's okay. Water under, the, water under the bridge. Water off of Doug's back. But I remember. <laughs> I won't hold it against you, but I remember. I know y'all was tight. But what happened? We were talking about this, I think, a couple weeks back here with some of the rank men. And those same people who were, who were upset about it were like, yeah, but we understand now. It was that you had to put us in a frame of mind to be more focused about the work than the social hanging out. I'm not saying you can't get together and have a good time. But your, your motivation was not the Lord. Your fervency was not the Lord. It was the after party. I, I tell you, I don't want to be... 
too judgmental without proof. But I have a, a, a strong comparison in the scriptures when you see all the issues that all the churches had and leadership had to blast them on these issues. We got a lot of schools that got that party mentality more than serve the Lord mentality. And they use God as the excuse for revelings, but they're not reveling for God. It's subtle, but you see it. And I'm not saying you don't, right? You, you can sing and dance and rejoice in the Lord, but are you really doing it for the Lord or are you doing it because you like the fiesta? You like the party? Just like you changed Sunday for Saturday, just like you changed Christian for Israelite, some of you move in that spirit. So everything we do is to bring order, to bring structure. Again, I'm not saying we are supposed to rejoice, be in our mirth on the feast days and stuff, but is it for the Lord? Hey, remember, we used to uh, do barbecues and stuff for Pentecost, right? But then people were playing sports and all types of other stuff, right? It wasn't about the Lord. So we had to change the environment to try to bring that into perspective. And I'm going to tell you, very early in my walk, I had a hard time with that. Because I remember we used to do, like, cards and stuff like that. I remember, I think I remember Deacon Laba one time, years back, talking to me when we were in 1088. And it wasn't me that I was, but he was talking to all of us in that setting. But I remember that I had a feeling about what he was saying. And I was like, I don't see the harm in it. I didn't understand yet. I didn't understand yet. And that's why I use the example of that here, because a lot of y'all that are still here understand that and, uh, and, and see why we roll that way. So I got to shut this down and start from scratch, and we're going to build up where we become work-focused. We're going to become focused on the Lord, right? Uh, so they were tasked to set order. So if you have a, an aversion to order, you have a resistance to the way we have rules and structures and how we do things, that's another sign of a casual believer. Right? Murmurings about policies, an organization, or simply disgruntled by it, it shows in your behavior. You don't hold in esteem the mercy we have to fellowship as commanded in Leviticus 23 and the unity of brethren in Psalms 133. And what I mean is that there's a respect that should be had to the body coming together and being able to come together and fellowship to learn and build ourselves. It should never be a chore, it should never be an inconvenience. Every opportunity that we have, again, you look historically through the forefathers and the struggles they had in captivity to fight, to serve the Lord, and how easy we take for granted that is here. Right? We do the Monday night class here. And I, I get it, maybe in the rare instance where people live, I don't know, I'll say more than 90 minutes to be nice. Uh, but if you're within a 90-minute drive to get here for a Monday night class, the school should be packed. Whenever we have anything going on here, even, even if it's not a high holy day, we should be filled out. Yes, I understand there's rare instances. Oh, I had previous plans. I had something previous that's already scheduled. But some of you, you know if you're full of crap when it comes to that. We should always rejoice in us being able to be together. Always. But that's not always the case. Right? So, disregard for the way we dress. Uniform, uniform, uniform. This side of the room. This side over here, sisters. This side. And whatever congregation you're in here, if you see me the other way, that side of the room. If you, sisters on that side or on that side, wherever you at. Uniform. Casually, you'll do everything in your power to make an excuse as to why you won't, don't, or can't comply with God's order. Uniform builds unity. It builds, uh, they call it a spirit, the core. It's like a camaraderie that we move in that way. Esau understands this. They really got that from us. But you go into their military, and, and not that it's lawful, but they don't even want you to have your own hairstyle. They shave your hair. They put you, everybody dresses the same and looks the same. There's no individuals. 
And that's why I say this side of the room, by and large, there's always something. We put a dress, we say, wear this dress. I don't want to wear the dress. Can I wear this variation? Can I wear that? Can I do this? Can I do that? Some of them will even go so far as to put embellishments on it. That's not uniform. You're casual because you don't understand the order that we're trying to build in God's kingdom. You're casual. Oh, Passover's coming up. I'll mention that. Passover's coming up, and we got specific uniforms for Passover for us to all be in unity. And guess what? I said this on the show. For you sisters that thought you were going to try to buy the same colors somewhere else, we have a very specific uniform that will be very difficult to replicate in its entirety. Don't be the one showing up without the uniform. Hey, and let me tell you something. I'm, listen, I'm griping a little bit. You leaders of the schools, you captains in these schools, it's a shame that you'll allow social media pics to go up with sisters not in proper garments. What that shows is that your school is full of uh, casual behavior and casual structure. Because I understand if there's a one-off, maybe a size thing that's not provided or something like that, but I see four, five, six, seven sisters all out of the proper uniform. I don't care what you think of it, what you think. It's the uniform. We've said this before. You're not going to show up to your job at UPS, FedEx, McDonald's, whatever freaking job you're at, and, and have something different. They're not going to allow that. But you'll respect that more than you'll respect what we're building here. It's less with the men. Very, you don't see it as much with the men. Occasionally you see the brother that'll get the garment, but then he wants to put something on it, right? You know, or, or one brother will start with something. Don't get me on the, like the, like nobody ever authorized the patches on the boots, brothers. I'm sorry, that's a pet peeve of mine. But it became endemic before anybody really caught it. So everybody think that that's uniform. So, you know, we're not making a big deal out of that. But there was never anything where you could put a patch on your boot. And it might seem like small things, but when you sway and you and let variability enter in, that's it, it, that's the begin because it starts with something like that, and then it'll be okay. So we did that, so now we can do this, and now we can do this. It just puts a spirit in the midst. But especially you sisters, if you got a problem with uniform, because guess what? When you in the church, you, they tell you come in your Sunday best, and now you got to wear different colors and stuff like that. But you made sure that you showed up dressed a certain way, right, in your best attire. We do the garments. We want order. We want unity because there's a lot spiritually that comes behind that, all right? Uh, intellectual casualness. You have intellectual casualness. You don't study to show yourself approved to God. You have poor study habits. You have poor prayer habits. So that when you put on the, the spot, the most high make you stutter and pause because you don't pray. You can't tell me that you pray frequently with a prayer like that. Yay or nay? Let's be serious. Let's be serious, right? Let's get 2 Timothy 2 and 5. Hmm. <clears throat> That's right. All praises, Bishop Yaosa. You know, I use the example of the patch on the boots. Like I said, there's a boiling of the frog thing. I remember Bishop Yaosa talking to me about this, right? They say, not that we eat frogs, right? But they say when you boil a frog, right, if you throw it into the hot pot, what happens? He jumps right out, right? But if you put him in and you turn up gradually the heat, I'm summing it up because Bishop Yaosa brought a whole thing on it. <laughs> Some, you, you turn it up gradually, you acclimate to it, right? He acclimates to the temperature, right? So you keep going, right? I, I <laughs> he said, no one noticed. I noticed uh, the frog thing anyway. So you, you turn it up a little bit. He's like, oh, okay, a little warmer in here. But it's not uncomfortable because the body had time to acclimate, right? And then eventually, right, you turn it up, turn it up, and before you know it, it's boiling and it's too late, right? By the time you feel the sting. So having a structural rigidity, an order as to how we set things up, and embracing that order, all right, 
needs to be paramount as well. We just gave those examples in the scripture about be subject to principalities, don't despise governments. How do you think you're going to serve Christ and one of his names is the governor? He's the governor. But you're talking about that you all about this truth and this war. It don't make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't go together. Let me get that in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that labor. No, is, that, is that what I wanted? Maybe I wrote it wrong. You know, I'd be typing 2 and 15. 2 and 15. You know what? I had an exclamation point instead of the one. I actually typed this instead of writing it. That's why I said I did the, yes, that's the one I want. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Right, so you're, when I say intellectual casualness, I mean with, with building yourself up in this word. The scripture says that we study to show ourselves approved to God. Not so you can be in the circle and know the most precepts. Not so you can be the brother that always has the answer to show out on the questions group and stuff like that. It says you study to show yourself approved to God. You show your conviction. You show your uh, unselfishness by building yourself up, right? The, the Bible teaches us to seek the book of the Lord and read. And I don't mean just watch. There's many forms of studying, and it's not just watching classes all the time. You must, must read. Especially the longer you're in this, the more you're applying these laws, more will be revealed to you in the scriptures as you read. And I'm talking about just read straight. Do your chapters. And I know it's hard. I know I'll do the reading and I start precepting. We're so used to precepting. And then the reading takes longer. Try to discipline yourself to just read. Make a little side note if there's something that comes up. In this. this is just my tip. Make a little side note if, there's, if a precept pops into your head. And make that a part of your studies for after your reading. Right? Because if you find that you're precepting too much, then you lose the continuity of what you're trying to do. Just take your little notes as you read, right? Make your little annotations, right? And then you can come back to those chapters after you've read them and then go through your precepts. Write your questions down. How many times I tell brothers, not all of us are going to sit down, I'm talking about in leadership, and you just sit there and we're going to start spewing out precepts to you. A lot of it is driven by questions that you'll have. And if you brothers don't read, then you won't have questions. A lot of time is, I've said this, I remember one time there was a Pentecost years back. Bishop Kanai sat down amongst a few of us that were there early. And he was like, right, what questions you brothers have? And almost everybody was silent. And I was like, damn. He was like, you know what that shows me? That you guys don't read. Because if you read, you should have questions. There should be something. Right? So that's why I kind of smirk about the brothers that do have questions all the time when I'm here. But it's not a negative thing. It's kind of like, okay, I suspected that you might, kind of, when I give that little smile. I suspected you had something that you wanted to ask, right? And then the dialogue flows from there, right? Yes, sometimes some of us have something burning in us as leadership that we might want to bring out to y'all. But more often than not, that dialogue is driven by your level of studying. And you guys should have those questions if you're reading, right? So we study to show ourselves approved to God. Go ahead. Come on, read. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Right. What I mean by casualness is that you're unable to rightly divide. You're not able to give the sense. Get me that in Nehemiah 8 and 8. You're not able to give the sense. You're casual in your learning. And listen, if you're very early in this, maybe a year, right, or so, trust me, expectations aren't as high for what you're going to be able to divide and discern. But if you've been here a while, you've got to be able to at least try to reason it out. Didn't I do something in the group the other day? And I, I, I got on y'all for something. I wasn't mean about it. But I had posed something, and I said, some because another brother had a question. And I said, I saw a lot of you saw, a brother had a question about the scripture. It was you officers. And I said, a lot of you saw it and didn't answer. And I waited a long time to see if you would, to see if the excuse about I was working or whatever. And I said, it's better to try it and be wrong because that's how you learn. Success is a poor teacher. 
Don't be afraid to give an answer. Yeah, we might get on you. And depending on the nature of your answer, you might get joked around a little bit. But don't let that break you. It builds character. All right? It builds character. Hey, when I, got, when I first got here, y'all was, oh, my gosh. You know? I'm, Gamaliel's still offended by me to this day when I tell him stuff. But those of you who got used to it, right? You built yourself up. You know, it's just nothing is ever with malicious intent, right? We might soften what we're saying to you with humor, but there's a level of seriousness behind it. But you have to study, one, to show yourself approved to God, not to any man, because you show him your fervency by doing that, right? And then to also not be so casual that you can't properly bring something out. And sometimes even if you don't know what the answer is, when you read, you should be able to say, you know, that kind of sounds like this. Let me go flip those pages and see what it says. Hmm. And either it'll be plain to you that, oh, yeah, that does go with that. Or then guess what? That's a question that you bring down and you say, hey, next time I see somebody with, that I know has some understanding, I'm going to go to them. I'm going to ask them this. I'm going to ask them that. Give me that, Nehemiah 8 and 8. The book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 8. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and cause them to understand the reading. Right. You must study to be able to cause others to understand the reading. I've said this in other terms before about giving the sense, right? I've said sometimes some of us can read something and we get what it's saying, but real understanding is that you're able to explain it to someone else, that you can articulate it to someone else. That's when you're really able to do something with it, right? You get a more profound understanding of it when you can teach it. I'll give you the example again with, with the Krav Maga. I just use that because uh, a lot, there's a lot of carryover in things like that where you're learning self-defense or any discipline, right? And I learned more when I started teaching it than I ever did as a student. And, you know, you've heard that before. Who learns more, the teacher or the student? The teacher does because... He has to be able to transmit that information so that people may be understand it. You have to cause them to understand it. Not just because we said it and we might be an authority on it, but you have to be able to really know what's being said. So there's some of us that we go to great lengths to take all that off of a scripture, off a verse, maybe ask questions, so that you can go ahead and be able to really grasp it and not just memorize it and say, yeah, because uh, bishop or deacon or captain s said this was the breakdown, that's it. You got to be able to then explain it for yourself as well, especially when you're going to have people that are minds are warped in Christianity and not be able to understand. Teaching is not read a scripture and then say, see, you got to be able, because some people do that. See? And then you're mad that they don't understand. And not everybody has that ability, but you'll build that up if you do that. So you cannot be intellectually casual. This is why Bishop summed it up beautifully. You study, pray, and apply. And if you're consistent in those things, if you move in those three, and I mean, there's a lot more that comes under those three banners, but in its simplicity, if you focus on those three things, you'll be able to build up more fervency in this, right? Um, anything else outside of that is just casual behavior, not fervent belief. So I'll give you a few more examples. I'm definitely not going to be able to get through everything that I want to bring out, but I'll do my best. Someone who always has an excuse for breaking the Sabbath and under the guise of a must or have to. I said I was going to talk about this more. You trim your ways for a job just once, and they're going to have you on the hook. Oh, can't you just work this one Saturday? Can't you just? And you're like, man, I got to do it. You're afraid. You're afraid to say no, that you can't do it. And I'm telling you, you do it once, they will get you every time on that. Some of you are like, no, I'm going to, at the interview, I don't want to tell them I can't work Sabbaths. I'll just work them for three months and then tell them that I can't anymore. Right, the job see that you're a casual believer. That's why they won't give you the time. 
they see you're full of crap. How much easier for us to see your casual belief? You got to stand for your convictions. You can't. You got to be devoted. That's uh, Amalek and their wickedness and their blaspheming of God's name. They stand their ground on that stuff. Man, in New York City, they'll even like close certain things and shut down certain streets just for uh, Amalek holidays because of the the, the respect that they put, they won't, they won't trim, I mean, it's all warped what they do, but they won't trim their BS. And then here we are, like you say, your job see that you're casual, right? And all these excuses, oh, I got to do it, I got to do it. Do you really? Have you really tried to put your foot down and stand for the Lord? And then see that he going to provide for you. And guess what? It don't mean you might not lose the job, but maybe he present a better one. Right? And I'm not saying go out and some brothers will be like, oh, Deke said this. Or you seek your own salvation with fear and trembling. I'm just giving examples. All right? I'll give you another one. An aversion to fasting. Ooh, boy. It should be in the front of your mind to use fasting for our benefit. It's a gift and tool God gave to us. Fasting is for you and God, not for others to see that you're fasting. But we must show unity in fasting together. Let me get Matthew 6 and 16. Then just different things that I noticed that I'm like, oh, that's a casual person. That's, they're not serious about this. There's some people still. That was one thing that, that's another thing I worked on here was the fasting. I tell you, boy, I would be up here fasting and everybody eating next to me. At the table, no less. I'm like, bro, what the hell y'all doing? And guess what? Remember what I said earlier about do, uh, right? do as I say, not as I do? People see that. And when people see that, what do you think they're going to do? It's not right. You should have your own convictions in the Lord. But you see that and it becomes disheartening, right? It 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 uh it disrupts where your mind and your where where you're trying to be with that. I mean, let's be real candid. Unless you have some severe medical thing and you deal with your doctor and between you and the Lord, what reason could you really have to not do the fast other than you just didn't want to? There isn't. There's no, I had a long day. I didn't prepare properly. Guess what? It's going to be a rougher one then. The Lord going to see that. The Lord going to see that. And let me tell you, not just fast and just fast, but that's a great opportunity to read, to study. Most High opens things up for you. It's called afflicting your soul, brothers and sisters. Why are you trying to go into that thing? Again, there's that casual, self-serving. No, I had to make sure I drank two gallons of water. I had to make sure that I didn't do it because, you know, I worked all day and it was hot and I didn't prepare properly. Do it. Man, there have been times I've been sick. Sometimes I haven't been able to finish it because it just I wound up being so jacked up. Very rarely as I built myself up. You know, it's like one of those things where, like, you got to be able to do it before you could talk so hard about it. Like Bishop, when he taught the thing about the name change, he changed his name first before he, <laughs> before he came out and started getting on everybody about that, right? That's why those of us who, who might not have applied that yet don't really get on people for that. <laughs> but with the fasting, I'm going to get on y'all. Now, what reason do you have, especially if it's frequent that you don't do it? It's frequent that you don't do it. Casual. Because the scriptures talks about fastings often. We'll get to that in a second. Paul said, I was in fastings often. Matthew 6, 16. We're going to read 6, uh, 16 through 18. Come on. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 16. Because I said, it's for you and God, not for others to see. But go ahead. Come on. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Come on. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face. Why? Because fasting, the, the problem is that y'all look at fasting as a chore. You think of the thirst, you think of the hunger, 
You think of the uncomfortableness. But it says fasting should be a rejuvenating thing. That's why it says anoint your head and wash your face when you fast. Because it, it should not be something where you're like, oh, it's it, in the spirit. It's a, a, a magnifying thing that you do for the Lord. These are things that show levels of commitment. Go ahead. Come on. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father, which is which is in secret. Uh huh. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. If you believe in that enough, then you do it for God. Not because of the pressure of people. I, I, I'm going to get on your behind if you're not doing it. I'll tell you now, and I ain't got no qualms about it. And if you get mad, you got the devil on you. Because there ain't no sin in me getting in your behind because you're not fasting with us. Sh tell me it's a sin. That someone want to, I want to Matthew 18 you. What did I do? You got on me because I was out the spirit. And I didn't, you're not going to say that. But I was out the spirit and I didn't fast. And I got no good reason why I didn't. There's no sin in trying to encourage somebody for that. I'll tell you what. I don't talk about things that I haven't felt a way about. Again, man, Laba, Laba be getting on people. I got him as an example again. Deacon Laba, he would get on us with the fasting when we were trying to build ourselves up. He used to make us raise our hand. Who's fasting and who's not today? We would raise our hand and be like, and then he would blast us for not fasting. Blast us for not fasting. You got to build that up. That's good. That's love to try to build that up in somebody. I don't, there's no reason. There's not a reason outside of something medical that you don't do it, that you don't partake. It doesn't make sense, especially you coming from your house to here or maybe you, know, maybe you hit camp or whatever. What's the extenuating circumstances? So if you got an aversion to fasting, there's an issue. Second Corinthians 11, 27. What time is it? Go ahead. I want to get to the other part of what I got to bring out. Come on. Book of Second Corinthians, chapter eleven, verse twenty-seven. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Right now, in the context of this, Paul's boasting rightfully about his fastings. About his fastings. Because what he shows you in all these examples is his level of commitment, his conviction and devotion to God and his people. And he, interestingly enough, mentions fastings. And not sometimes, he said often. He said in hunger and in thirst often. A lot of you just don't want to be uncomfortable for a few hours. you rather be able to revel and drink and eat and what it shows, fasting helps you build discipline. And it's interesting because those of us who do fast often, I want to show you the power of devotion. You will not break that fast. But if you're trying to diet and limit your calories during the week, you crumble the minute something <laughs> real tasty come up because you're hungry. And I use that as an example to show you that it's so much more than just trying to avoid eating. Because when you're doing it for God, you got no. Imagine if we were able to carry over that same discipline. Nobody would be fat because everybody would control their eating. But it don't work that way. That's to show you the power of when you do something for the Lord, how, how you're able to maintain it. And you know who you are, you brothers that don't be fasting. You should be looking for the fast dates. You should be anxious for when those times come to be able to jump on it. Let's get Psalm 69 and 10. Understand this about fasting. And then I'm going to move on from the fasting part. And I might start jumping around a little bit because I got too much. See, I knew once I did the Bishop Yawasop that I wasn't going to finish. <laughs> so, so <laughs> shout out to Bishop Yawasop. Whenever I see him come out with the papers, remember one time he was like, hey, Take a look at this. It was here one time. We're going to do a class. And he handed me like a little booklet, like staple papers together. I said, damn. I said, you're going to go over all that in two hours? <laughs> Psalm 69 and 10. The book of Psalms, chapter 69, verse 10. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, 
that when was I wept and chastened, chastened my soul with fasting. With fasting. Fasting is to chasten your soul. I want to chasten as a definition. No, I think I asked you for it. Let's look that up. Fasting chastens your soul. See, the thing is, you don't do it, you have an aversion to it because you don't see it as a benefit. To you, you still see it as something silly, something simple. Chasten. Let's read that. Chasten. Verb. Of a rebuke or misfortune. Have a restraining or moderating effect on. All right. One of the things says humble, right? What else you got? Get, get, give me dictionary or Webster. No, what else you got? What else you got? Let me see. All right. Okay, you can read that. Go ahead. To correct by punishment or suffering. Discipline. Discipline. That's the example I gave with the dieting, right? It'll help you build discipline, and not just in food things, but in all things. If you can be disciplined enough to fast, it says fasting helps chasten your soul, right? Scroll down. Look, it says purify. Uh, there was one, let me, what does dictionary say? I saw one where it says something about humbling. Hit, click see more. Click see more. I know that was I know that was a uh, see more. Go back to Google. But it said to humble. You want to humble your soul. You want to bring yourself more in line with the Lord. You want to build yourself out of that casual belief. Fastings often. Fastings often. Fasting is a tool to chasten your soul. All right. So how do we come out of this? Well, self examination is necessary, and it's a spiritual gift to be able to truly unobjectively examine oneself unobjectively that means you, you take out all your things that you would bias towards and only measure it against what the scriptures say it's kind of like the broke the egg thing i did some time back right if it broke on your watch whether the action was intentional or not you broke the egg right not, oh, it's rolled, oh, it's spilled, oh, I dropped it, oh, I wasn't paying attention. You broke it, right? So self-examining unobjectively is, is something that needs to be worked on and prayed for, right? And uh, I wanted to deal with that at length in a little bit. I don't know. I'm going to be jumping around a little bit, right? But first, okay, you have to try and get respect for the Lord. Okay, you have to really get that back because a lot of times you don't. Let's get Ecclesiastes 5 and 1. All right, I'm going to try to move a little faster. So I need you to read a little more enthusiastically. Yes, sir. Someone messaged me and they said you weren't putting emphasis where you needed to. Okay, yes, sir. I don't got my reader, see? But we're going to have to do more reading exercises here because a lot of y'all suck at reading. Ecclesiastes 5 and 1. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 1. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. Uh -huh, come and on. be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. And guess what? Wherever Israel is, right, that's where the house of the Lord is. It's not the church building Christianity would teach you about. But you got to start to put respect on it. And it says, keep thy foot and be ready to hear rather than come and give your opinion, rather than come and have your thoughts on where you think these things should be or how they should be, right? Moses understood that. He's basically grabbing that from that. Let me get that Exodus 3 and 5, right? Come on. It's that you forget that coming through these doors, this is that I'm saying, you got to build back an appreciation and a respect. We've been given something. Our eyes have been opened to something that many are not able to see or understand. And I think in the process of time, what should happen if you're building yourself right is that you build it up more, but a lot of times you don't. Now's not the time. We should see people more fervent, more on fire, not less. Read that. The book of Exodus, chapter 3, verse 5. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place wherein whereon thy standest is holy ground. Right. Keep thy foot. Keep thy foot. That's why it brings that out. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of the Lord. All right. Let me get Lamentations 2 and 18. Lamentations 2 and 18. 
book of Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 18. Their heart cried unto the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears run down like a river day and night. Give thyself no rest. Let not the apple of thine eye cease. Right. This is the part that I wanted. It says, let not the apple of thine eye cease. Read on. Arise, cry out in the night, in the beginning of the watches. Pour out thine heart like water. The apple of the eye for God is Israel, the Israelites. And his laws and his ways then should be the apple of our eye. And it's not. It's not the priority that we have. Here in verse 19, it says that we should be crying out. In the beginning of the watches, we should pour out our heart like water before the face of the Lord. Go ahead, come on. Lift up thy hands toward him for the life of the young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street. Right, and they were going through it in these days and were still able to lean on him. And now you got some small things, some play-play issues, and all of a sudden, what was me? I can't deal. I got every excuse as to why I'm not convinced and, and, and have conviction in me as to how I move in this truth. Let me get Psalm 17 and 8. Psalm 17 and 8. Dealing with the apple of thine eye. Psalm 17 and 8. The book of Psalms, chapter 17, verse 8. Keep me as the apple of thy eye. This is being said to the Lord. Keep me as the apple of thine eye. Come on. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Zechariah 2 and 8. Zechariah 2 and 8. The book of Zechariah, chapter 2 and verse 8. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoil you. For he have toucheth you touch for he that toucheth for he that toucheth you touches the apple of his eye. Right. So I said Israel is the apple of God's eye. So we should return that favor. We you know what the apple of the eye is? That's your chief thing. That's everything to you. It's not something you do. It's not there's nothing casual about it. It's everything. So likewise, he must be for us as well. Proverbs seven and two. Proverbs seven and two. The book of Proverbs, chapter 7, verse 2. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. We must have that, the apple of our eye. Why does he say the Lord? Let's get John 14, 15. You want that with the Lord? You want that reciprocation? This is what we must focus on. The book of John, chapter 14, verse 15. If ye love me. Keep my commandments. Right. If you love him, you show that he's the apple of your eye. You must move in that way. So we got to get back to having a reverence and a respect and a fear. And if you really sit down and examine it, many, many, many of our people here in this truth, in a process of time, seem to lose that. That reverence, that spec, that awe for the Lord gets lost. Look, a lot of people are just here because they know this is the only place where they get an understanding of the prophecies. But let it come back to doing things that require betterment, that require doing what we need to do so that the rest of those prophecies can come to pass. Everybody likes to hear it, but we don't want to do the work that it takes so that the Most High can deliver it to us. So the sanctuaries and the assembly of this nation together is a holy thing. It's a holy thing, and it's a special thing, and we must never take it lightly. Let me get the definition of holy real quick. Come on, I want to move on to my other part at least. I, 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 I knew I had way too much. I knew it. I knew it. I didn't even get to where I wanted to get. Holy. Let's read that. Said, remember, I said the sanctuary and the assembly of this nation together is a holy thing. Come on. Holy. Specially recognized as or declared sacred by religious use or authority. Uh huh. Consecrated. Consecrated. Now, click on consecrated. Come on. S sacred or set apart. It's sacred. It's set apart, okay? It's sacred. It's, set it's a holy thing. It's consecrated. You have to look at it. That's why I say it's the privilege, it's the honor of being able to come together, to be there, to see those things, right? 
We must seek and display fervency at all time. Before we move on to those scriptures, let me get the definition of fervent. Come on. Maybe next time I go through the other part. I don't know. We'll see how far I get. I'm going to try. Go ahead. Come on. Fervent. fervent. Having or displaying a passionate intensity. Right. We must be fervent. It says you have a passionate intensity. You display it. I will show you my faith by my works. Faith is not something you keep in a little bag or in your wallet and nobody sees it. And you just say, oh, do you know what my faith is? Because you would see the fervency for the ones that are faithful. I've said this before about faith. Faith, you're going to make things happen. If you lack it, you make excuses. And that's all they are, however valid they might seem to you. And then you're offended when somebody's excuse ain't good enough for you. First of all, the hell with what I think. The Lord see that your excuse is BS, and you should be more fearful of that. And you know what? I understand the seriousness of what we're doing. So the excuse that you have is not going to fly with me. And you could be mad all you want about that. I don't care. Listen, I'm not here to make friends. I'll be friendly. I'm here to have the love and respect of the congregation because of the works that I put forth. Not because I might be funny or a nice guy or whatever the hell you think of me. But as long as I'm doing what God says I need to do, then I know I'm right. I'm okay. But so many more are worried about, it's not to say that, you, listen, there's unity, there's love of neighbors and all of that. But it's not at the expense of, of the reverence and fervency that we should have for the mission. It's not above it. It has to be right there with it. Let's read some of those similar words on fervency. Impassioned, passionate, intense, vehement, ardent, fervent, uh -huh. sincere, mm. feeling, profound. Deep-seated, heartfelt. And you think about this, and there's so many. Look, we spoke about embracing it. We spoke about it being in your heart, right? It, we spoke about being uh, uh, enthusiastic. Casual is laid back. It's laxed, right? And these are things that you see in people. Look, it says emotional. It should feel emotional for you to be in this, in the, in this spirit. In that fervent. Look, another one says dedicated, committed, devout. Do you know what it is to be dedicated? You hear that sometimes at the job. Oh, he a dedicated worker. We had a blizzard today and he showed up. All right? And then you got things here and it's every reason why this ain't done, why I'm not doing that, why I got the devil on me, why I'm nasty with people. All types of excuses for all this stuff. Let's get 1st Maccabee 2 and 51. 1st Maccabee 2 and 51. Let me give you some examples of fervent. The book of 1st Maccabee, chapter 2, verse 51. Called to remembrance what acts our fathers did in their time. Uh-huh. So Called to remembrance what acts our fathers did in their time. You want examples of fervency? Well, first of all, Christ is the ultimate example, right? But he's not talking about him here because Christ wasn't yet on the scene yet. All right. So go ahead. Come on. So shall ye receive great honor and an everlasting name. Jump to verse 54. I'm only going to go through some of them. Come on. Phineas, our father, in being zealous and fervent. Zealous and fervent. He only mentions fervency with some of them, but all of them had it. All of them have it. Go ahead. Come on. Obtain the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Jump to verse 58. Verse so Phineas was a fervent example. Come on. Elias, for being zealous and fervent for the law, was taken up into heaven. Elijah, for his fervency. Because you know what happens when you're fervent? You cannot, you will not be passive in this. You will not be casual in this. There will not be excuses. Nothing's going to stop you from doing what's required of you. So you got to seek that fervency. You got to be excited. But you can't be excited if you lose that awe, if it's not the apple of your eye. You got to really take a self-assessment after today and say, man, am I really passionate about this? Or has this just become something I do? Has this just become a, a, a process and just a routine and nothing else? You should be zealous and intense for it. Let me get Acts 18 and 24. 
Let's try to get through this quick because I'm trying to get through my part. I know normally I say don't let people get where they got to get. They can catch up. Acts 18, 24, and 25. The book of Acts, chapter 18, and verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. So they said he was eloquent and mighty in the scriptures. But guess what? Go ahead, read. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit. He was only those things of eloquent and mighty in the scriptures because he was fervent in spirit. Come on. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And that was with only a partial understanding. He had not yet understood the glory and magnitude of Christ. He said he only knew the baptism of John. But he was fervent. And the Most High gave him understanding to teach the scriptures. And what that means is that he wasn't casual with his intellectualness in this. So he was able to give people the sense and cause them to understand. That's what really made him eloquent. It's not always the nice words. The reality is, the, the and I'm going to say, they're not really fancy sounding words. Again, it's just, it's just being able to have more uh, language to pull from. All right. But most people don't understand those things. So the eloquency is more than just that he used certain types of words. It's that he was able to make that plain for people to receive it. He was strong in the scriptures, and that was because he was fervent. So he wasn't just studying from himself, but to show himself approved to God and bring that out. Right. Let me get uh, let me jump around a little bit. I think Romans 12 and 11. The book of Romans, chapter 12, and verse 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Right, so not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Fervent, you show your fervency by your service to the Lord. Nothing's going to get in the way, no matter how small it is, of what you got to do to do it. You got respect unto the sanctuary, respect for your brothers and sisters, respect for the congregating, reverence to the Lord as the apple of your eye, and not just a passive thing that you do. I'm telling you, it's so easy to fall into that, especially if you had a heavy Christian background, especially more so because you fall into those patterns of behavior and you think that that's enough. You got to be able to bring more out of that. Because if not, you're not useful for anything, right? Let me get that uh, real quick. I'm, I, di I didn't have this down. Uh, where uh, I'd rather you be warm or hot. I want to show you something in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, 315. The book of Revelation. Chapter 3. In verse 15. Come on. Verse 15. So I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. Come on. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, I want to give you a different twist on this, right? Because a lot of times we look at the cold as a bad thing, right? We say, I'd rather you be cold or hot. I'm going to try to sum this up without getting too into it. When you're using water for different purposes, right, most of it has uses in it being cold, right? Cold, refreshing drink, okay? Uh, cold water for certain aspects or hot, right? For teas, coffee, different things like that. But very rarely does something call for lukewarm water, right? So, like, that's like when you're at camp and the brother that was out the spirit brought the waters, but he brought it. We, I'm, I'm never forget that because this is Arizona and it's hot. His responsibility was the waters. He brought the waters, no cooler, no ice, and then had them on the hot rocks for brothers to drink that, right? So when you drink that water, what, you open it, you spit it out your mouth, right? because it don't feel nice, okay? The cold and hot really symbolizes that you're useful. It goes into that fervency, all right? 
I know a lot of times we talk about cold and this and that. It, you got to think about the context of how water is used. Why wouldn't he spew out the cold then? So you have to be able to have that fervency because if not, is you're not good for nothing. So you got to have some temperature. You can't be that room temperature. I mean, that water that was in the thing was extra hot, but in the, the, the plastic bottle, the leaching of the stuff into the bottle. Right? So you got to be able to have a purpose in something. So when it says cold or hot, it's really meaning that you're, you're fervent for the Lord in one aspect or another, right? You could look at cold and hot as fervency and zealous, right? And not, and not like, oh, you're cold that you're not about this. The, the lukewarm is the casual brother or sister. You're just here. You take a seat. You're always in issues. You always got something to say about somebody. Nobody really knows you for anything good. You know what would be a good exercise for a circle for sisters and brothers? Is have somebody sit there and talk about what that person is known for. And if you're honest about it, you're going to be very surprised. Especially amongst you sisters. And if you start hearing things like a pleasant smile, this, that, and the other, if the sisters decide to do that circle, men need to sit there to keep them on track. Because they're going to start talking about how pretty their hair are, how nice they dress, all that other stuff like that. And you'll see if somebody meets that cold or hot or if they're a lukewarm brother or sister. When the time comes that you got to give a testimony of a brother or sister, that's when you can say, that's why I love these things we do with the men and the reviews and stuff like that. I love that stuff because it gives you a time to really stop amidst all the going, going, going and be able to sit there and really reflect on, on somebody. Because a lot of times we go on what we feel rather than an honest assessment of of what's really there, what you think somebody should be from the snapshots you see versus what they really are. And you'll see, and you'll see who's that casual one and who's not. I'll tell you that for sure, all right? Um, damn, what time is it? Uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna just finish these few scriptures I got because it'll take too long. I wanted to go into uh, Mark 4 and Matthew 13 like I said, some of you had seen that when I did that in a class here and bring that aspect out, but I'm not going to be able to. Maybe I have to do a follow-on of this uh, at a future opportunity, and I laid the foundation with this. But let's go back to Romans 12 and 11. I'm still dealing with the fervency. The book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. It's fervent in spirit, Colossians 4 and 12. Colossians 4 and 12. The book of Colossians, chapter 4, verse 12. Right, so we had Phineas. Uh, who else we had in Maccabees? Uh, Elijah, right? Uh, in general, Paul here was talking about uh, being fervent in spirit, right? Go ahead, come on. Colossians 4, verse 12. Ephesus, who was one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. Always laboring. Always laboring what? Fervently. Always laboring fervently. Always, always fervently. Intensity. Enthusiastic about it. Go ahead, come on. Always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Right. Why? Because we're trying to build people up. Your leaders and such were here to, for the perfecting of the saints. Let's get 2 Corinthians 7 and 7. 2 Corinthians 7 and 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 7. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he was told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me. So that I rejoice the more. And guess what? The fervency is not just in display of your works and your efforts. It says it's commendable to have a fervent mind towards your teachers, towards your leaders, right? This is why in Thessalonians it says, know them that labor among you and esteem them highly for their work's sake. 
because it's done for the nation. It's done for the people. Some of y'all look at people that are doing things, and you you got that uh, crab in a barrel. Oh, they just, why are they always in there? Why are they always volunteering? I don't get to volunteer because they volunteer. What? There's more than enough work to go around if you really wanted to volunteer. Why are you volunteering all the time? I was going to volunteer for that, but I couldn't because you did first. That's the nonsense that people have and the mentality that people have. It doesn't make any sense. Let me get uh, 1 Peter 1.22. So the fervent mind towards your leaders and teachers, right? And then that leads us into what? The fervent love that we should have for each other. And with that love comes res- great respect. First Peter 1 Peter 1.22. The f- book of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing ye that have purified your souls in obeying the truth throughout the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Uh-huh. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. 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 For, with enthusiastically. That's what I'm saying when I said that to put the respect back on us being able to be together and fellowship and have that opportunity around each other. It says we got to be fervent in that regard. First Peter 4 and 8. The book of First Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. That, and you read about charity. And all it represents in 1 Corinthians 13, okay, it says you should have not just charity, but fervent charity. Fervent charity. Read it again. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. So charity is going to cover the multitude of sins. I'm going to go over these last parts that I had here, okay? Let me get uh, Hosea 10. And 12. I skipped a bunch, but I I do want to give this part. The book of Hosea, chapter 10, verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Right, so I'm moving towards this closing. And here in Hosea says we're commanded to sow to ourselves in righteousness, to reap in mercy and to break up your fallow ground. Can we get the definition of fallow? Let's get the definition of fallow. I didn't put it there. Damn, I thought I did. I must have had it written down and I didn't put it here. Define fallow. Okay, let's do this one and then uh, also we'll look at Webster's Dictionary. What is? Read that first one there. Fallow, a farmland. Plowed and harrowed, but left unsown for a period in order to restore its fertility as part of a crop rotation or to avoid surplus production. Right, so a fallow ground is that it's ground that was prepared to receive seed, right? But it was reserved for a time, okay, so that you can go ahead and it can be more um, profitable, right? Go to dictionary. Go ahead, read. Of land, plowed and left unseated for a season or more. Right. So I'm not going to keep going through them. Go back, read Hosea 10 and 12. I want to deal with the fallowed land part. Go ahead, come on. The book of Hosea, chapter 10, verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Right. So he says, it's time to seek the Lord. So what he's letting you know is that the Most High has laid everything out for us, ready for us to what? Give that increase even more. So when it says break up that fallowed ground, it says stop with that casualness. It's time. It's time that you move and properly seek the Lord, right? Go ahead, come on. Till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Let me get Ecclesiastes 10. Ecclesiastes 10, and I want verse 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 12. For the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. Right, and those of you who are in that casual mindset, that's foolishness, all right? You're deceiving yourself. 
that casually believe. Go ahead, come on. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. Right, remember, we read in Ecclesiastes 5 and 1, it says, be more ready to hear than give the sacrifice of fools. Come on. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be, and what shall be after him. Who can tell? Come on. The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them, because he knoweth not how to go to the city. Right, well, so he's telling you that these foolish, and we're going to get back to this follow ground part in a second. These that are cash, they don't know nothing. Like you don't know how to get to the city. You don't know your way, right? We have a moving machine here of, of where you can go, what you can receive, the medicine and the scripture for all of it. And it's, uh, so what I'm really saying is that you, you hypocrites, you counterfeit, you fraudulent that are being deceived in your casual belief. He's saying that you're fools. Go ahead, come on. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. Right, so it says, woe to the land when your rulers are childish. Remember, it said, we got to set them in order to understand principalities, to understand governments, to see what's wanting and build them up. It says, when your leaders have a childish mentality, woe to your land, because they don't know what to do with it. There's no direction. Where there is no vision, the people perish. So he, that fallowed ground is talking about us as Israel, right? The scripture, see, this I really want to go over Mark because he talks about the seed on the wayside and everything, and it kind of went together. But I'm jumping to this part at least because this is what I had in closing, right? Let's read some scriptures about the childishness. 1 Corinthians 14 and 20. We're going to come back to Ecclesiastes. First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20. Your pacing has been killing me the whole class. Brethren. Don't let them read for class anymore. You're fine on the show, but uh, go ahead. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Right. Remember, it said when a child is the king, you're not going to have the proper behaviors that come behind that. Right? Because they've yet to be built up to fully understand what's required of them. And this is why many of you are in that childish state. These are the ones that give the resistance, the different examples I gave for all of that. That's why I say you're big babies, you're children. I don't care if you're older in age. It manifests itself as childish behavior. The literal fits that some of you throw. Tantrums. And it's offensive, not just to us, but to the Lord as well. Read verse 20 again. Verse 20, brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Be like men. First Corinthians 13, 11. Scripture goes and talks a, a, in various places about how we deal with childishness. Why? Because that means that this was present then in the men as well. In the, in the congregation then. Go ahead, come on. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Right, so there's actions, there's thoughts, there's behaviors of children. And those things must be put away. It, it amazes me how you'll see gray hairs upon someone's head and the childishness that you see from them. You don't really believe. You don't really believe. Ephesians 4.14. Ephesians 4 and 14. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. Stop with the childish stuff. No more to and fro because we're not going to be able to prosper that way. Is that in that verse? No, sir. And carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Right. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes 10. The book of Ecclesiastes S chapter 10. 16. Verse 16. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. Right. Meaning the priorities are off, right? And the morning's what? That's time to move, to work. It's not the time to be sitting down, having food. Right? I'm not talking about breakfast and all of that. What he's saying is that 
you're misprioritizing. Remember I said the party mentality? You're ready to eat in the morning. You're supposed to have that after a hard day's work. Okay, come on. Bless art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles. Ah, but contrary wise. But when your king, when your leader is the son of nobles, go ahead, come on. And thy princes eat in due season. And they know when and how and things are coordinated. Just follow the plan. Follow the vision as your leaders enact it. Go ahead, come on. For strength and not for drunkenness. Right. And you see that? When it says for strength and not for drunkenness, is that there's a time to revel and there's a time to be serious about the work. And when they says, and they're going to eat and they're going to prioritize that for strength and not for drunkenness. Go ahead, come on. By much slothfulness, the building decayeth. And through idleness of the hands, the house droppeth through. Right, that's that fallowed ground through idleness. And it says the house droppeth through. Uh, Matthew 20 and 6. It's always referring to us as agriculture, seed, land, right? It talks about uh, uh, olive trees, right? Sticks, branches. Agriculture is such an appropriate similitude for where we are and what needs to happen, all right? The scripture goes at great lengths to that. I love when I read stuff about that because like I said, I'm a city boy. I don't know a damn thing about agriculture, right? I know about concrete, and maybe they planted some trees along the highway and on the sidewalk and stuff like that. So w when I do my reading and I see these references he makes, looking up what it means in agriculture is really profound when you go back and you read, right? And that's part of that studying where you're able to give the sense, right? Where you're able to study to understand rather than just uh, in a cursory manner go over those things. Really meditate and reflect on the things that it says. Bishop gave an example of that with, damn, I, I can't say the word right, but it was the word that he used that he saw in the scripture, uh, uh, kabad or whatever it was. You remember the class I'm talking about? Kabad? Yeah, whatever it was, but that thing. And he said he had to look it up, and when he looked at it, it opened up a whole thing of understanding and precepts for him to bring that class out, to deal with that, and to show the lies of Amalek. Right? So it, it's it's... That's studying to show yourself approved. That's rightly dividing that word of truth to bring that out. And so you can't just read this stuff and take it at face value. You're not letting it get in you that way. Matthew 20 and 6. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there when I'm done. Matthew 20, verse 6. And about the 11th hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, why stand ye here all the day idle? Right, remember. So he was uh, in a vineyard. So again, dealing with land, that fallowed ground. We read that in Hosea. It's time to break up the fallowed ground and seek the Lord, not be lukewarm. So here he's giving you, and he says, at the 11th hour he went out and found others standing by. And he says, why stand this day all the day idle? Come on. They say unto him, because no man hath hired us. Right, that idleness is that lukewarm stuff, that you're just content showing up every Sabbath, having the seat, doing the bare minimum in this, instead of really obtaining for all the desires that we're supposed to be praying for to the Lord. Go ahead, come on. He saith unto them, go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Right, so he says, they said, because no man have hired us. Hosea 10 and 12, he commanded us to go out and break up the fallowed ground. In Ecclesiastes, we were talking about that when you have noblemen over it, they're going to take that vision and push it forth and display it in a way that all can follow behind it. We have been called to work, to work, to work. And if you think about it in terms of work, because some of you love your job so much that even sick you don't miss it, all right, then you'll take that same vigor, that same fervency here, and move in the spirit that you need to move in, or not. So this kind of lost some of its oomph because I didn't get to go to the other part with the different types of Israelites. And I know we've gone over that before, but there were some points that I wanted to bring out that, that would kind of relate to this whole thing that we were bringing here, all right? I didn't do it even though I was able to go a little over because there was no way that I was going to be able to give the full sense if I did it that way. So laws will life last. Uh, maybe I'll revisit some of this and bring it out in a, in a different manner. Some of you here got it because 
a lot of those scriptures that I was going to go over, I had went over with you guys here, but maybe I'll get an opportunity again to bring something like that out. All right. Um, you, oh, you wanted me to, t am I going to talk about this or one of y'all going to talk about this? Who, me? You're pointing to me? Oh, that's a thumbs up. Okay. Hey, I want to take the opportunity before we sign off. Well, first, before we talk about Phoenix, those of you who are watching this class, uh, make sure you subscribe to this new channel, all right? We had some issues with the channel. I said it at the beginning. There's IUIC in the classroom three. Make sure that you subscribe, like, turn on the notifications, all right? Let's get this up, 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 back to where uh, the subscriber base needs to be, all right? So that this work is not hindered. You see, fallowed ground, right? Now we got to go ahead and build this. Some of you are like, damn, but I'm not a teacher. I don't go give out flyers. Get on your behind, like, subscribe, and not just you, Let's get on the socials and push it, push it, push it. Let's get the subscriptions up on this new YouTube page that we got. And now with that being said, I'm going to take the opportunity to have y'all help us here at IUIC Phoenix. I need y'all to go over while you're in the process of making sure you subscribe and turn on notifications for IUIC Classroom 3. Go to IUIC Phoenix on YouTube. Like, comment, subscribe, all right? Through a lot of pain and labor, we've built our subscriber base up. Well, we like at 21 and change now, 21,000 and change. We're trying to get to 25,000 followers, all right? Um, every Wednesday, we got the Power Hour Plus. These guys put this up here for me to do it because some people are like, you're always plugging the show, D. You're damn right I am, unapologetically, all right? Uh, 7 p.m. Arizona time because it's not Pacific because there's a different time difference now. And 9 p.m. Eastern right now, but 7 p.m. Arizona time, all right? So, uh... Go on there, like, subscribe, get the notifications going, all right? Help us out because here in Phoenix, this is one of the cities where we're trying to spread the word, all of Arizona actually, and trying to make it happen. And while we're able to use these things, let's use them, all right? So uh, again, Lord's Will Life Last, I can bring out the other aspects I wanted to bring out. I pray y'all got some sense from that. And with that, we say shalom. <laughs>